Okay, we are live on YouTube. Good morning and welcome to the July 19th, 2022 public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We'll begin this morning by taking attendance and I'll turn it over to our general counsel, Mark Silverman, to call the roll. Chair Carroll. Here. Vice Chair Bland. Here. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Here. Commissioner Chapin. Here. Commissioner Chen. Here. Commissioner Devonshire. Here. Commissioner Goldblum. Here. Commissioner Gustafson. Here. Commissioner Jefferson. Here. Commissioner Lutfi. Here. Commissioner Holford Smith. Here. Right. Good morning again, and welcome to the July 19th public hearing and public meeting of the Landmarks Preservation Commission. We're, uh, this meeting is uh, being held via Zoom and being also live streamed on our YouTube channel. And uh, we have a full agenda today. We will be starting with a public meeting agenda, which on which we'll continue the um, application to well, we'll continue our review of the application for the demolition of West Park Presbyterian Church pursuant to a hardship app, uh, proceedings. And then we will look at an application that has already had a public hearing and is back today with revisions. And then we will uh, move to our public hearing agenda to review new applications for work on designated properties. And um, if you would like to testify on any of the hearing items, you may do so by joining the Zoom meeting at the estimated time for that item, which is shown on our agenda, which can be found on our website. And if you would like to watch the proceedings, you may do so by going to our YouTube channel. So I'm going to turn it over to our Director of Preservation, Corey Harala, to read the first item into the record. Thank you, Sarah, and good morning, everyone. Start today's Preservation Department agenda with public meeting item number one, LPC 22-09135, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1217, lot one, 165 and 167 West 86th Street, AKA 541 Amsterdam Avenue, the West Park Presbyterian Church Individual Landmark. This is a Romanesque revival style church complex designed by Henry Franklin Kilburn and built in 1889-1890 which incorporated an existing chapel designed by Leopold Eidlitz and built in 1883-85. The application is to demolish the building pursuant to section 25-309-B2 on the grounds of hardship. This was last presented at the public hearing of June 14th, 2022. Uh, public testimony was heard. However, no other action was taken at that time. I'll now turn it back to Chair Carroll. Great. Thank you very much. And before we get started, I just want to say a few things. First, I want to be clear that we will not be taking a, a final action today or in the immediate future. Um, as you know, LPC held a public hearing on June 14th, and at that time I explained that we were going to have a robust and methodical process. On June 14th, as Corey said, we heard a presentation by the applicants and we heard testimony from the public. In addition, we received written testimony, which was shared with the commissioners. After the public testimony, we closed the hearing and took no action. Since June 14th, the commissioners have been reviewing the materials submitted by the applicant and the public, and eight commissioners, including myself, went to the site to see firsthand the conditions of the building. In addition, people have continued to voice their opinions on the application, and as always, we're making these available to the commissioners. I would like to ask the public to please send all submissions to testimony at lpc.nyc.gov. Uh, instead of sending it directly to commissioners. That way we can be sure that all materials are part of the file and, uh, and ask you all to please refrain from sending uh, materials to some commissioners' personal email addresses, which are not part of the LPC records. So all materials submitted to the testimony email address are made available to the commissioners. So please uh, try to use that portal. It's testimony at lpc.nyc.gov. So the purpose of today's public meeting is to continue to gather information as part of our review of this application. 
We will open the proceedings so the applicant can respond to the June 14th public testimony, which is our standard practice. And then the commission will have an opportunity to ask questions based on their review of the materials submitted to date and observations on the site visit. And I just wanna briefly sketch out the next steps after today's public meeting. The commissioners and staff will continue to evaluate the information submitted by the applicant and by the public. And we have previously asked our engineering consultant, Donald Friedman of Old Structures, who was present at the site visit, to review and comment on the submissions. We are also in the process of engaging an outside expert to assist the commission in its review of the application. So we will reconvene at a public meeting after Labor Day where these experts will present their findings to the commissioners. And no action will be taken until after this public meeting. Okay, so with that, um, I would like to ask uh, Commissioner Gustafson if you would make a motion to open the proceedings. So moved. Thank you, and Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the, we've opened the proceedings and the applicants may begin by uh, starting with their response to the public testimony we heard in June. Thank you. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Valerie Campbell. I'm a partner at Kramer Levin and we represent the West Park Administrative Commission. We appreciate the commission's attention to this application during last month's lengthy public hearing and during the site visits, which occurred last week. The applicant team is here today to respond to some of the issues raised in public testimony and to answer your questions. I am joined by Roger Lee, the chair of the West Park Administrative Commission, Marcia Flowers from the West Park Congregation, Ken Horan, president of Alchemy Properties and his associate, Benjamin Charles, Dan Kaplan and Toby Snyder from FX Collaborative, Rick Lefevre from Facade MD, Mohamed Raoul from Severud Associates, Adam Wald from Appraisers and Planners, and Elizabeth Pinocchio from CCI, Jim Brand from LBG, and my colleague Patrick Sullivan. We have submitted a detailed letter that addresses many of the comments made during the public hearing. This letter includes supplemental reports from the architects, Facade MD, appraisers and planners, as well as letters from the Presbyterian Church USA and Ira Schumann, who's a vice chairman at Seville's New York. I would like to start off by saying a few words about the statutory and the judicial hardship test. During the public hearing, some people stated that the commission should be applying the judicial test for hardship rather than the statutory test. The judicial test for hardship is set forth in the Snug Harbor decision and stated that when a charity did not wish to sell its property, a comparable test would be where the maintenance of the landmark either physically or financially prevents or seriously interferes with the carrying out of the charitable purpose. The court added that in this instance, the answer would depend on the proper resolution of the subsidiary questions, namely whether the preservation of the buildings would seriously interfere with the use of the property, whether the buildings are capable of conversion to a useful purpose without excessive cost, and whether the cost of maintaining them without use would entail a serious expenditure, all in the light and the resources of the petitioner. This test was articulated in a constitutional takings case, but it has been used by the commission for not-for-profit hardship determinations in those instances where the statutory test set forth in the landmarks law did not apply because the owner did not wish to sell its property. There is extensive discussion about the commission's use of the judicial test in the Marymount school hardship determination. In Marymount, the commission issued the school a notice to proceed with the construction of a gym on the roof of the historic building. Here, the church does want to sell its building, so the use of the statutory test is completely appropriate. However, the Marymount determination noted that the findings of fact that must be made in applying the judicial test are basically the same ones that the commission must make under the hardship provision in the landmarks law. The commission's precedents in considering the judicial hardship applications are instructive in informing the relevant factors for statutory hardship. These factors include both the cost of any necessary repairs to the landmark and the financial resources of the church. 
Finally, in the event that the commission does approve the notice to proceed, the, the church is constitutionally entitled to realize the fair market value for its land. We agree that there's no constitutional requirement that a landowner must always be allowed the most beneficial use of its property. However, it is highly misleading to suggest that this general precept of land use law would prohibit the church from seeking and satisfying the hardship standards set forth in the landmarks law. In the event that the commission determines that a hardship has been demonstrated under either the statutory or the judicial test, there is no legal impediment that would prevent the church from selling the property at market value and devoting the proceeds from this sale to its religious mission. To deny the church the ability to do so would be a taking and would undermine the essential constitutional purpose of the hardship remedy. Moreover, any suggestion that the church should be compelled to transfer its property to a non-religious organization in order to enjoy the full measure of its property rights would be constitutionally suspect in placing additional burdens on religious organizations and treating them unequally. Thank you for your time this morning. Uh, Roger Leaf would like to speak next. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to respond to the comments submitted on the June 14th public hearing relating to West Park's hardship application. I am Roger Leaf, chair of the West Park Administrative Commission, speaking on behalf of the church. I'd like to limit my remarks to the two central issues of our hardship application and to the new information that has been submitted since June 14th. Specifically, the two central issues are whether the building could be capable of earning a reasonable return and whether the building has ceased to be suitable or appropriate for purposes to which the church is devoted today. With regard to the reasonable return calculation, opponents to our application questioned whether the appropriate methodology was used, whether a broad enough range of alternative uses were considered, whether construction costs were overstated and whether the sale of the building would meet this test. Sub the submission by appraisers and planners was conducted in strict compliance to the landmarks law, in particular to the pre precedent set in the Stahl York matter. In response to comments made at the public hearing, appraisers and planners have submitted two statements. The first addresses the flawed financial analysis submitted by the opponents, and the second explains why adding historic tax credits to the analysis would not result in a reasonable return as defined in the landmarks law. At the June 14th public hearing, some opponents claimed that our construction costs, particularly contingencies and other expenses, were overstated. For clarity, we have provided additional detail to support these costs. It is important to note that the $50 million estimate did not include any so-called soft costs, which are typically 25 to 30 percent of construction costs for a project of this type, and it did not include any costs related to the repair of the north and south walls of the sanctuary, which we will discuss later in this presentation. But even if the construction costs for the base case were as low as 40% of our original estimate, appraisers and planners has confirmed the building still would be unable to generate a reasonable return. It is also important to note that any change in so-called dominant occupancy use, as DOB uses that term, of the structure by a new owner would require the issuance of a certificate of occupancy, which the building does not have today. This would necessitate the clearing of all outstanding DOB violations, including for the facade, bring, and to bring the entire building up to code, including all fire, life safety, and accessibility issues that are currently grandfathered. Any offer to purchase the building would have to address these costs, which in our judgment could easily exceed our $50 million estimate. We've not received any offers that take these costs into account. With regard to whether the building is adequate for use as a church today, the key issue is whether in its current condition, the building is appropriate for religious services, regardless of the size of the congregation. In this case, only code issues that relate to a dominant use as a church would be relevant, which would exclude ADA concerns and any grandfathered code compliance issues but it would include all safety-related DOB violations and any structural concerns, particularly as they relate to the sanctuary itself. Our submission documents, both the north and south walls of the sanctuary are leaning outward. In a July 15 letter, 
which was not included in the packet we sent to you because it was received after the cutoff date for submit, the cutoff time for submission. Severed Associates stated that in their professional opinion, the outward lean of the north and south walls is quote unquote excessive. They are currently monitoring whether this movement is ongoing and also what repairs would be required to stabilize the structure. While an assessment of the most appropriate remedy is ongoing, preliminary estimates are that any repair would cost well over $1 million. The cost of such required repairs, combined with the cost of repairs to the facade to address the current safety violations, clearly exceeds the financial resources of the congregation, even assuming additional income from shared use of the space. The overwhelming burden of maintaining and repairing the building has made it impossible for the church to devote its resources to any other purpose. The church has been without a pastor since 2017 and can no longer support the community outreach programs that define the congregation in years past. In marked contrast, the issuance of a notice to proceed with demolition would enable the church to construct a safe, sustainable place for worship that can also support the arts. It would provide a funding for the needed revitalization, revitalization of this storied congregation and it would enable the Presbytery of New York to support community service programs across the city. Other issues raised on June 14 include whether the present condition of the building is self-imposed, whether the church pursued the sale of unused air rights, and whether all available sources of funding, including loans and grants, were pursued. Our application demonstrated the church has expended all of its financial resources in an attempt to maintain the building, including the sale of its manse and the elimination of nearly all its staff. In 2022, the congregation has had to go into debt to cover its current operating expenses and to pay for emergency repairs. We also documented the Presbytery's very limited resources to assist its 89 member churches with building condition issues. Included in our July 15th submission is a detailed letter describing the different entities within the Presbyterian Church USA and the extent to which such entities can provide funding to any of its more than 8,500 churches in the denomination. Small grants are generally offered to new churches but are not available to established congregations for capital improvements. Loans by the Presbyterian Investment and Loan Program, or the ILP, have to satisfy strict credit requirements similar to those of a commercial lender, lender which the church cannot meet. It is worth noting that the church did obtain a $30,000 collateralized loan from ILP in 1986, which it repaid in 2002. In 2012, the church also approached ILP for funding to make building repairs, but could not meet the credit criteria, so no loan was ever made. Our July 15th submission also includes an analysis by FX Collaborative of the feasibility of selling the church's unused development rights. As their analysis clearly demonstrates, the draconian steps that any potential receiving site would have to go through to utilize the church's TDRs would make any transfer all but impossible. Also, several of the suggested receiving sites would require a section 7479 special permit for transfer, which is almost never utilized. They are cumbersome, time consuming and expensive, and approvals are far from certain. Only 11 such transfers have ever been approved in the history of the statute. Opponents also argued that the space is suitable for use as a church because the sanctuary is currently used by the Lighthouse Chapel. But Lighthouse simply rents the space for less than $6,000 a month and does not assume any responsibility for the maintenance of the building. If there were any safety or other concerns, Lighthouse can simply find another place for worship. This would not be an option for the West Park Church as owner of the building. Finally, it has been suggested that granting a hardship to West Park would open the floodgates to applications from other nonprofits. But as the record shows, only 30 hardship applications have been approved since the landmark law was passed in 1965, and only one in the past 20 years. The very rigorous standards set forth in the statute could only be met in extreme cases such as ours. I would now like to turn it over to Mohammed Rawal of Severed Associates to discuss some new information regarding the structure of the building. Rick Lefevre from Facade MD will then respond to comments on his facade report 
followed by Adam Wald of Appraisers and Planners, who will discuss the addendums to the economic analysis. Thereafter, representatives of our entire team are here to discuss any and all of these matters further with you and to answer your questions. Thank you very much for your time. Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Mohammed from Severed Associates. I'd like to discuss um, a few chief structural concerns with the building, um, some of which were already discussed in the um, site visits, but I will repeat them today. And I'm going to describe some of our recommended uh, reinforcement measures. So we um, had uh, suspected that the north and south walls were leaning based on uh, visual observations that we made late last year and early this year. And uh, we did uh, engage um, a licensed surveyor to, to, um, to map the, the north and south walls. And uh, what we found is that the, the north wall is leaning outwards towards the top by a dimension of eight inches over a height of 33 feet. Um, and that the, the, the north wall is similarly leaning outwards um, uh, by a dimension of four inches over a, a height of 18 feet. And uh, I don't know if it's possible for me to share the screen, but uh, if somebody needs to give me permission. Abby, who has control of the present of this of the slides right now? Toby does. Okay, and this has our new appendix in it that we submitted last week. This is what's on the website. Yes. Okay, I'll I'll just move forward to those uh, to those images. Thanks, Toby. At the very end. That's right. Thank you. I don't think I'm able to rotate it, but I think, can you work from this, Mohammed? Okay. Um, <clears throat> so this, this is a, obviously a rotated uh, 90 degrees counterclockwise, but uh, if, if you zoom in, Toby, that this is, this is a map of the uh, uh, south wall of the church, which is facing 86th Street. And uh, the area mapped is, is basically the, the area of the south facade uh, in the area of the round stained glass window, which is kind of centered on uh, it, within the, the sanctuary of the church. And uh, as you can see that this wall is leaning outwards uh, toward the top, like I said, eight inches, which in, in our professional opinion is, is uh, on the excessive side. Uh, and, and certainly, you know, what this, this does is um, uh, it, it creates unbalanced uh, forces on the wall. And so the stresses that you see, uh, particularly on the outside face of the wall are uh, about two to three times higher than, than normal. And uh, per our calculations, we're finding that the, the stress in the wall based on the fact that it's supporting not only itself, but it's also supporting portions of the, the floors, the mezzanine, the first floor, the ceiling over the sanctuary and portions of the roof. Um, the, the stresses in the wall because of the lean um, are exceeding 300 psi, and uh, for historical masonry, we we uh, we usually cap a limit of about 250 psi of compressive stress for kind of a, an acceptable limit. And obviously, it, it depends on uh, the, the quality of the mortar, but but generally speaking, historical masonry wants to be 250 PSI and lower. Uh, in this case, it's around uh, because of the lean and because of the unbalanced bending in, in the wall. It's at about 317 PSI. So uh, it's about 27% overstressed. Um, so that, that's not necessarily going to mean that uh, we need to clear out the area and that everything is going, going to come down and it's an emergency. But 
it, it implies that it's a structural condition that we recommend uh, to be uh, addressed um, and that steps be taken to, to stabilize the wall. Uh, and if you could go to the next slide, Toby, that shows the, uh, the, the, the north wall there. So this is uh, the, the north wall. The church has a similar condition. It's, it's kind of in the same area uh, adjacent to the, the, the central part of the sanctuary. And uh, again, the left of the sheet is to the top because it's rotated. Um, but um, I will note that this wall is um, this wall is shorter than than the south wall. Um, but uh, so that's why you know, the the outward lean is about four inches as opposed to eight inches in, in the red area shown. However, the the clip or or the gradient of the lean is is identical to the, the south wall. So in other words, from the kind of a little bit lower than, than the, the bottom of the, the round stained glass window, which is where the mezzanine is to the top, uh, it's leading outwards at kind of the same clip as the um, south wall. So again, it, it's, it has a similar situation where the, the extent of the lean is, is um, unacceptable and it's creating a condition where there's excess stress in the outside face of the wall of the this existing masonry wall particularly on the left and right sides of the uh, round stained glass window and um and so the, these are the conditions that we have um observed and uh, we we recommend that uh, corrective measures be taken to stabilize these walls, um, number one, so that uh, it relieves the walls of the excessive stress, and number two, so that we ensure that that the, the walls do not continue to lean outwards till it gets to the point where it is a, an immediate safety concern. And the way we propose to do this is to uh, provide steel girts on, on the face of the walls that are bolted to the walls and tie them with tie rods through the roof so that the, the north and south sides of the church are adequately tied together. If I could add um, one additional step we took with our surveyors is to install uh, monitoring devices on both the north and south wall to determine if there is any continued movement that would uh, exacerbate the current situation. Uh, those tilt beams will provide us with real-time data about the condition or any additional movement in the wall. And to the extent that that movement is serious or continuing, that may change the sense of urgency with regard to these repairs. Perhaps our next speaker uh, could join us now, Rick Lefevre from Facade MD. I believe many of you met him on the on-site visits. Um, he will uh, discuss his additional findings with regard to the condition of the facade of the building. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Rick Lefevre. I'm the president of Facade MD Architecture and Engineering. Um, I'm a licensed engineer in 10 jurisdictions in the United States with uh, 36 plus years experience in exterior restoration. Uh, this is a continuation of previous testimony and previous information regarding the current condition of the sandstone exterior cladding of this building. Uh, as Mr. Leaf had suggested, I led two tours of commissioners. Comma. Uh, this is James Giselle from Landmarks. Good morning, Mr. Rossello. Did you mean to say something? No, Rick, I think that was a, a mistake. Just please go oh, ahead. Oh, okay, all right. Uh, interactive is fine with me, go ahead. Uh, where I am right now is uh, between the first presentation and, and this current uh, presentation, there were two tours that uh, I led uh, on site with commissioners. Um, what I am trying to portray or what I'm trying to emphasize and repeat is that uh, the visually apparent status of the 
two types of red sandstone. Uh, the more finely detailed red sandstone uh, is in obviously poor condition, as is evidenced by the photographs that are included in previous testimony and previous reports. The lighter color or the brown sandstone, the, the majority of the field of the wall, visually the extent of deterioration appears to be much less, uh, but as a result of physical examination by sounding with a uh, plastic headed mallet, uh, in my opinion, approximately 50% of the reachable uh, sandstone is, is returning a dull or hollow sound, suggesting that the bedded layers of the sedimentary stone, which are vertically oriented as opposed to their natural horizontal orientation, are beginning to separate. Uh, in other words, the rusticated portions of the, of the exterior that visually appear to be in reasonably good condition. Uh, the photograph on the left shows uh, a somewhat typical extent of deterioration uh, from our close range examination. And uh, another, with respect to my, uh, my colleagues and other uh, professionals who have examined this uh, building from a distance, we have the, uh, we frankly have the sole uh, ability to say we were this close. We were touching portions of the building and we were within two to, I would say two feet or so of the majority of the outside of the building using a uh, articulating boom lift uh, several months ago. So we have unique perspective of close range. Uh, the visually apparent from the street using binoculars or from available window locations and roof locations, uh, in my opinion, does not give a full picture of the extent of deterioration of even the, uh, the red sandstone detailed, in, uh, detailed carved material or the rusticated uh, brown sandstone, which constitutes the majority of the field of the building. Uh, estimates that we made were based on not only our visual, but also our very limited, uh, very limited physical examination of the building. Limited because of the uh, apparent fragility of the stone and the, the obvious uh, damage that we could see from close range. Uh, this perspective allowed us to come up with a an estimate of the number of stones that we felt were necessary uh, for repairs that were candidates for repairs. The only way in our opinion to provide additional number information is to sound each and every stone. Um, in our opinion, sounding each and every stone will require a considerable amount of additional protection because the uh, looseness of the material that's evident on the building will result in large areas flaking off. And without additional protection, such as pipe scaffolding throughout the street facing uh, elevations of the building, we were not uh, comfortable with proceeding with additional um, physical examination or physical sounding or physical probing of the building without this additional uh, protection. I think that is a continuation of the logic that 20 plus years ago led uh, to the installation of the sidewalk shed. Uh, we are currently in discussion with uh, other commissioners of LPC to provide sidewalk shed um, access so that additional tours can be provided and uh, performed with our personnel and with anyone uh, from LPC who is interested in attending so that uh, additional physical examination can be made uh, and a clear picture of the general state of deterioration of the sandstone can be achieved. And obviously we are here to answer anyone's questions and to uh, provide additional information as we are able. Thank you, Rick. Um, next, I'd like to ask Adam Wall to discuss some of the more uh, uh, recent uh, additions to his uh, economic analysis of the building. Uh, 
Adam. Thank you, Roger. Um, so we were originally engaged to evaluate the economic analysis component of the hardship application to determine whether a reasonable return could be achieved. Uh, we initially submitted an analysis that demonstrated the property did not achieve a reasonable return for all three scenarios. Uh, in response to questions by the commissioners and the public, we prepared some follow-up to some of the questions that were raised. Uh, given the, that our time is somewhat limited, I, I'll address some of the high-level points uh, that, we, that we thought uh, needed uh, some comment. And we'll, I'll refer you to our July 15th submission. And of course, I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, the, the first item was the, uh, the, the Feinhirsch report, which was submitted in connection uh, with Hiller PC's, um, I, I, I guess, submission. Uh, so, several claims in the Feinhirsch report were unfounded and not proven. Um, we, we addressed them in detail in our July 15th follow up submission. Uh, primarily, his calculations do not accurately provide for the 2% appreciated repair costs in the analysis, which is key to the application and to the economic analysis. Uh, he also suggested that a condominium be explored as it would produce, quote, a far more revenue. And as we demonstrated in our, in our follow-up submission of July 15th, we project the sellout of a condominium would fall over $20 million short from the cost to even, to even uh, do that project. Uh, Feinhirsch also suggested that a, a retail component uh, would also generate substantial revenue for the property, but given the limited signage, uh, the lack of transparency or glazing to display product, uh, we think that there'd be very few retailers who would be willing to take this space, especially at the rents that Feinhirsch suggested of nearly $120 per square foot. Uh, in summary, we, I would just say that, that the, the, the Feinhurst submission, um, while it, it brings up some interesting concepts, does not really address anything uh, related to the, the economic analysis and the reasonable return, and it doesn't really provide anything useful uh, for any continued uh, review or discussion of that. We are also we're asked to address the concept of historic tax credits, which was suggested by a few parties uh, that this be a component of the analysis. Now, we would note that historic tax credits, they do not reduce the overall development costs. They can provide some relief to a project developer and potentially reduce the overall financing needed to complete a project. Um, primarily, we would note that the, it is, the project is not available for state credits because it's not in a, a designated census tract. So it only be available for federal credits. And that a federal credit uh, would only be available um, if it was able to create a nonprofit entity to syndicate or sell the credits in exchange uh, for, for an investor who's willing to contribute cash equity for the rehab, rehabilitation. So essentially, if it's a if the 20% of the total costs would then receive a tax credit investment. Uh, syndication rates of those costs are between 80 and 85%. So even though that you get 20%, you often don't get the full dollar amount from that from the tax credit investor. And then there's additional costs that developer has to give, essentially give back to the investor in the form of cash flow and a, a buyout at the end of the, the five-year tax credit. What our analysis shows is that even if you do include the federal tax credits, uh, it, it would only decrease the development uh, obligations by 13 to 15 percent, and this did not produce a reasonable return. And we would note that the analysis assumes uh, all costs would be avail available for the credit, which is likely not the case. And we would also note that it does not include any of the soft costs, as Roger has mentioned, and we had mentioned in previous testimony, it does not include any soft costs or transaction costs associated with securing the tax credit, uh, which can be considerable professional costs. Um, so the, the reduction in the total development costs of only 13 to 15% does not produce a reasonable return. Uh, and it still produces a negative return in the base and the infill scenario. In the multifamily scenario, a small positive return is achieved by, uh, by using federal tax credits. However, 
um, discussion with other professionals indicate that this like this project would likely not be approved because of the substantial work that has to be done to the property in order to uh, create legal light in there. And that'll most likely not qualify for historic tax credits. So we, we submitted this in the July 15th uh, supplemental submission and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Adam. Uh, Chair Carroll, that completes our formal response to the June 14th comment uh, period. Uh, we now uh, pass it back to you. All right, thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the thoughtful and methodical response. All right, so we're gonna now move to our questions. Um, commissioners, I know eight of us, uh, including myself, were on the site visit. So, uh, and we've all been reading the materials submitted. And I know we have a number of questions based on those materials as well as our observations on the site visit. So, I'm going to ask, I'm going to uh, um, ask you all to raise your hands. I know some have uh, questions that they've prepared in advance, so that can help kick it off. Um, and even if you go through all of the questions that you think you have now, it's of course, later if, if one of your colleagues is asking a question and it makes you think of something else, please raise your hand again. I think today is important to make sure that we get as much information as we can. So um, if we, uh, when, you, when I call on you, please go through all the questions you have at this time, but then please feel free to ask more questions later on. Okay, so um, commissioners, please raise your hands if you're ready to start. Okay, I'm going to start with Commissioner Holford Smith, followed by Commissioner Devonshire. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have several questions. Um, I understand that the physical probes were not performed, uh, and I don't believe that non destructive evaluations were performed either. Um, normally, this is a um, process that would help determine the, the, the sort of construction of the wall, potential locations of anchors, um, sort of, it can also show whether some, the stone is delaminating, uh, delaminating from the backup brick, and whether there is evidence of any kind of rusting of anchors in the wall, um, although I, uh, the visual evidence does not suggest that that's happening. Um, can you explain how, why you have not performed any of these um, evaluations to date? Rick? Yes, I, I would repeat that uh, our close range examination uh, as, as uh, the commissioner just suggested here did not indicate any visual uh, evidence of rusting that would suggest a direct correlation with the uh, corrosion of anchors buried inside the, the, the wall securing the stone in place. And the, uh, the general um, fragility of the wall uh, made it very difficult for us to, uh, to suggest additional physical probing. We were concerned about the, uh, the stability of large sections of stone. And that was the reason why our probing was enormously limited. And how about non-destructive evaluations, thermal imaging and different, different methods that there are to map the surface of the wall to determine um, subsurface conditions? In terms of uh, thermal imaging, uh, we have that capability, but uh, in our opinion here, the, the physical sounding that we provide that we performed on, on a limited basis was at, at least as adequate and as informative of the uh, status of the wall. Um, we're we're happy to perform additional non-destructive, uh, but in our opinion, the, the more uh, valuable means of performing additional investigation of the wall is going to be physical and is going to require the uh, additional protection that I mentioned earlier. I will add on the structural end of things that uh, we we did see a lot. Um, certainly, more can be done to expose the the existing plaster around the the the, the surface of the wood trusses. Um, but without getting too invasive, uh, if you go into the attic of the building, you, you can see uh, pretty much all of the structure, and we we are able to see enough about the walls about the the way the, the, the roof structure is kind of twisting and flexing outwards to, to sort of make an assessment um, based on what we know now. 
I think my, my overriding question is, is whether you understand how the walls are constructed, sort of what the makeup of the wall is, the backup brick, the thickness of it, the thickness of the stone, where the anchors are located. And that's sort of typical information that we would normally expect to see in early evaluation of a wall to make an assessment of, of how much stone you think has to be removed. We, we do know from physical probing the limited physical probing and also from the extent of deterioration of some of the sandstone that we're looking at between five and I, I believe I said eight, it, it's actually between five and nine inches thick. Um, that is the uh, overall understanding of the thickness of the, um, both the brown and the red sandstone. Uh, regarding anchorage, we have found very limited um, Anchorage at the tower area of the building. Um, at down low, we have not been able to detect uh, anchors. Period. It's possible that they were ferrous and they have uh, deteriorated to the extent that they're uh, basically rust or or dust. Uh, but in order to perform additional physical probing here uh, at any area other than basically the, the street or the, uh, the top of the shed, uh, again, I'm gonna say that we would need additional physical, uh, physical protection. But also add that in connection with the stabilization of the north and south wall, it probably will be necessary to do some test borings just to determine how those anchors could be put in place. So um, more work will be done certainly, and we will work with you on that to, um, address any of the other concerns you think are appropriate? Yes, without question. So you had suggested uh, upwards of 50% of stone replacement would be required. That's across all of the sandstone, the brown and the red. Um, and that's really based on mostly a visual observation. Uh, I suggested in my July 15th addendum to the uh, previous testimony that when we sounded the brown sandstone, uh, where it is available, down low, below the shed, and on top of the shed, uh, approximately 50% of the brown sandstone was coming back, was returning a hollow sound. I, I did not say that I was saying replace 50%. I was saying that 50% was returning a dull or hollow sound and would require one of I gave four possible uh, repair schemes or, or four possible means of addressing that condition. Replacement, rotation of the stone, retooling of the surface of the stone, or patching of the surface. Uh, in terms of which of these particular types of repair would be required, that's gonna have to be uh, an individual judgment stone by stone, which again, um, the, uh, the delicacy of the current condition of the stone, in our opinion, requires uh, getting up close and performing uh, sounding with additional protection. Okay. Um, just looking at my, some of my questions. Um, So based on the observations that you've done so far, has there been a phase restoration been sort of mapped out and how you could address sort of more immediate needs first and um, address lesser, you know, less critical conditions later, just to, you know, to assist in the overall cost of the project? Yeah, the, uh, Over time. the concept of a phased restoration of this building um, is, to, to my understanding of the current condition, is problematic in that in order to determine how much of all of the stone is in particularly deteriorated state, uh, we would be relying primarily on visual and visual uh, we're looking at the red sandstone. Most of the tower at the top of the tower is in poor condition. 
in order to get to the red sandstone at the top of the tower, uh, I'm, I'm afraid we would be piping the tower of the, of the building. And in order to pipe the tower of the building, we're probably looking at piping most of the street facing um, areas of the building period, which is a very considerable uh, initial uh, financial outlay. Uh, in order to have the close range that uh, is necessary to perform this stone by stone evaluation uh, and to have the necessary physical protection that I've discussed in, on a number of uh, occasions, uh, we believe that we we would be looking at um, piping the entire building uh, at considerable expense. And once the building is piped, uh, I think from a financial standpoint, it really only makes sense to do all of the work once the uh, pipe is installed. So I'm not sure the practicality of breaking this piece or breaking this project into pieces uh, is going to be financially viable or even really uh, make any sense at all. Just because of the uh, redundancy and the general conditions cost for access. Okay, thank you. Um, Mohammed mentioned um, discussions of the, the plaster. Um, and I, I know in the, on our walkthrough uh, site visit, he mentioned that the, the, there's evidence or he is, the plaster cracking is sort of leading to conclusion that the main roof trusses are, are um, deflecting. And I was wondering if those have been measured um, to see if, if that uh, is substantiated or whether the, actual, the plaster itself is cracking because of other conditions um, inside the church. Mohammed? Yes, so the, the plaster is cracking um, due to deflection of the truss. So we did measure the deflection of the, the, the two main trusses and um, they were, uh, the readings came back to be about two to two and a half inches over the span, which uh, for a 64 foot span is is within reason. So um, uh, that's, so we, we, we need to um, consider that there's other factors beside the deflection of the truss um, that's causing the, uh, the outward lean of the walls. And uh, it's, it seems to be mainly due to uh, the roof uh, flexing outwards and spreading outwards and um, on review of, of uh, a lot of the photos that we took from the attic um, it, it does appear that um, a lot of the the members on this roof um, just like many other old structures uh, they're not really mechanically fastened it's it's a lot of bearing um, connections some of those bearing connections have slid uh, you can see some of the, the wood headers kind of twisting and warping. Um, so it, it's, it's really the, the outward lean of the wall is, is coming down to uh, not just vertical deflection of the trusses, but also lateral deflection of the trusses outwards, uh, flexing of wood members um, that, that is creating a thrust against the, the north and south walls. So I think my question was really um, more about the the main roof trusses and the and the plaster cracking around the, those 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 trusses, um, and also wondering if the plaster itself has been sounded to see if it's still if the plaster is still attached to the lath and the lath is still attached to the backup. Has any of that been that has investigated? Not been no, that has not been done. Um, it's uh, it's part of uh, our current recommendation involves doing that and, and probing the plaster, um, but that w we haven't taken that step yet. So I think that that leads me to my maybe my last question. Um, what are the next steps to um, in in the best investigation of both the plaster and the the trusses as well as the exterior masonry in order to remove any kind of ambiguity on, on conditions. Has there been a plan put in place to do further investigations? 
Yes. Yeah, so, so on the structural side, the next step is, um, as, as I, I mentioned in a, in a letter I recently sent to Roger, that the next step is to do um, further probing investigation of, of the uh, wood trusses from in the areas that are concealed by plaster, particularly in the photo you're looking at um, uh, here, especially at the bearing ends to see that uh, what the condition of the wood that is concealed by the plaster is, and if that wood has been rotted or is, is uh, subjected to um, excessive signs of excessive stress. And uh, the, the only way, uh, in my opinion, to do that is to expose the plaster and remove it. Um, there have been other suggestions that some, some less invasive methods could be used, like boroscope, but uh, um, the way I see it, uh, the only real way to, to, to do that is to expose and remove the plaster. Because if you try to use a boroscope, there are so many um, wood pieces and, 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 and debris and lath and, and uh, uh, cement in the way of in between the plaster and the wood furring that you wouldn't be able to see anything with a boroscope and you wouldn't really be able to see anything with one of these, these methods. Um, the, the really only way, uh, recommendation we have that makes sense is to, to remove sections of plaster around the areas of suspect concern and to, to actually look at that wood and, 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 um, and determine the condition uh, visually by sounding the wood. And also um, there are tests you can do to the wood to, to determine its density and, and whether it's, uh, it, it, it's stiff enough. Um, so th there's that recommendation and, and there's also a recommendation to do pilot holes and probes on the surface of the existing brick bearing walls within the church also to expose the wall to, to um, look at the condition of the mortar, to see how uh, sound the mortar is, uh, and to, to determine the thickness of the, the walls, the, the brick backup walls on all floors. Um, so there is currently a plan to do that further investigation. And the recommendations we make today are, are solely based on uh, what we know now in terms of the lean of the walls and the flexing of the roof. And so when more things come to light, there may be other recommendations at that point. I would add that we're continuing to monitor the deflection of the north and south walls with uh, tilt beams that have been installed uh, on the outside to measure whether there's any additional movement, um, which could be a critical measure of what the appropriate response would be for for repairs. Thank you. I think that's those are my questions for the moment. Great, thank thanks. you. Commissioner Devonshire. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. Um, I guess, Mohammed, um, one of the things that I was curious about when we were looking at the interior of the church was what possibility the cracking of the plaster can be attributed to differential expansion and contraction of those two materials. The, the wood is, is hydroscopic, the plaster is less so. And of, of course there aren't uh, soft joints in the plaster. And when this place was unheated for and unclimatized for such a long period of time, there was expansion and contraction of the, of the wood that was much different than that of the plaster. How much of that can be attributed to that differential expansion and contraction? Yeah, it, it may certainly be part of that, um, uh, but I think the- Thanks. Just the- um, that, That's, just wanted to know in general. Um, I guess uh, for Facade MD, I have a couple of questions. Um, you know, our, our office follows strictly um, guidelines that were set up. There's a, an ECOMOS, a US ECOMOS scientific committee, which is the 
Um, it's called ISCARSA, the International Scientific Committee on the um, Analysis and Restoration of Structures of Architectural Heritage. They have set forth guidelines that one can use in establishing interventions on buildings such as the church. One of the steps that um, one takes in establishing an intervention is what they refer to as anamnesis. It's a medical term that refers to the research into past actions on a building. And the, the reason for that is that previous actions on the building, or um, in this case, what appear to be uh, some pretty lax maintenance, but previous actions can also have an effect on the building today. Um, the, the use, for example, of Portland cement uh, mortars as repointing on the brownstone, things like that. Um, was there an anamnesis effort taken before the on-site um, visual examination of the building was done? And, and I, I asked this sort of because there can be patterns established, visual patterns of deterioration that can be caused by previous actions. Commissioner, yes. Uh, we examined uh, available documentation regarding previous repair campaigns on mm -hmm. the building. Uh, I think you had mentioned uh, during our tour that uh, the sort of uh, inappropriateness of the repair mortar, particularly at the red sandstone at the tower areas of the building, uh, we had suggested long ago that the extent of uh, repair mortar that was used at the tower uh, was Perhaps it was more in tune with 30 plus years ago, what might have been sort of acceptable at that point. It would be really uh, unfortunate. Uh, it was nowadays, never acceptable, but, but people were doing it anyway. It would be, it would be a lot, yeah, uh, it would be very strange to have, as you suggested, a, a, a material that has such varying physical properties from the original substrate material um, that, that obviously is problematic. What's also problematic is the absorption rate of this material at the top of the building. And uh, the fact that we have uh, a, hard, uh, a hard mortar material, the patch uh, at the top of the building, uh, that again, in terms of its absorption rate, it is in fact concentrating uh, penetrated water at the uh, relatively delicate substrate around the backside of the patching is undermining the, the structural capacity of, of the wall here to support that, that patching material. That's another uh, of the items that when we got up close with the articulating boom lift, we were very concerned about the red sandstone. And I think well, that's a lot more uh, visible with binoculars from the street. It, it certainly exacerbates the delamination of, of face bedded sandstone, without a doubt. Um, I'm, I'm not sure um, if, I mean, the, the bedding mortar probably is, is appropriate and it would just be that repointing, that outer repointing mortar, which probably was sloppily done and not very deep, that would be the issue. The other, another question for you, you have in fact, um, not established, I mean, again, I understand the, the you, you take some issue with, with scaffolding this building and sounding every stone. Um, we consider that standard when we're approaching a project like this. In order to establish those levels of um, repair, of intervention that are going to be necessary, including perhaps retooling, including um, composite repairs, including um, Dutchman, and including uh, full stone replacement. You have not established, correct, that schedule for levels of repair for this building. Uh, Commissioner, that is absolutely correct. We okay. have not. We have not established, and, and I said that 
I, I gave the sort of extenuating circumstances, our close range examination uh, suggested that the delicacy of the existing stone here may re really precluded our, us performing physical examination that well, we felt was necessary to get to that level. You, you said something about your, your fear of large sections of stone falling apart. When you tap one stone, if that stone falls, it does not necessarily take five or six other stones with it. Is that correct? Because uh, those, those in, stones in are, sense, are discrete units. Commissioner, in, in a sense, I agree with that. In another sense, uh, we were together tapping the brown sandstone. And my concern with the extent of hollow return on brown sandstone was that I was going to lose large portions of the entire face bedding, that uh, the, the entire stone was going to separate. But you, I, but you, even, even by sounding, even tapping, you can't tell at that point whether you're going to be get, going so deep with that delamination that you have to install a Dutchman or whether it, it might be able to be repaired with a composite. Is that correct? I would concede that point. Yes, okay. Commissioner. Now, the other thing that I, that I have not heard mentioned is the possible use of cast stone rather than, um, say, replacement East Longmeadow stone at, at higher levels on the church. Was there any consideration given to the use of, of substitute material at higher levels? Absolutely, yes, Commissioner. So, so then any numbers for replacement are referring to actual stone replacement, or are they talking about cast stone too? Our numbers are based on uh, replacement in stone. Uh, the the reduction of cost. Well, that's a worst case scenario, correct? Uh, yes. Okay. That is. In terms of, I, I want to make the point though. In terms of the the volume, the number of stones. Uh, some of the responses that we have seen suggest an arbitrary reduction by fifty or even seventy five percent of the number of pieces of stone. And our examination, our limited physical examination uh, of tapping stones, uh, in my opinion, uh, if there's any reduction at all, it will be minimal in terms of the numbers of stones that need to be addressed to some extent. And in fact, I'm quite confident in the suggestion that that number, uh, the number of stones that will need to be addressed in some fashion is going to increase rather than decrease. But, but without without examining every stone on this building, that's a guess, correct? Without examining every stone, yes, that, okay. that is a guess. I'm extrapolating the limited amount of information that I have over the field of, of the entire wall. Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? All right, I have a couple of follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. um, so just following up on Commissioner Devonshire's question about um, once, you know, once it is determined the level of repair versus replacement, um, that's an option here. The, how would using alternate materials, so if it can be just retooled and you use a composite cementitious material versus a cast stone versus real stone. How, what, if you can speak broadly, what would the kind of variation in costs be? Uh, it would be less. Uh, I would hesitate to, to give you a, a, a knee jerk reaction at this point. Okay. Uh, there would be some reduction in terms of the extent of that. Uh, off what, the top of my head, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, uh, Rick, I, this is Dan Kaplan, uh, FX Collaborative. We, uh, Chair Carol, we, we had uh, LBG look at um, cast stone replacement, and we will provide you with uh, uh, their, their findings. Um, it, uh, it was not a significant, uh, it was a reduction, but it was not a significant reduction, enough, enough to move the overall analysis uh, but we will we'll provide you with, with a, a follow-up. Okay. 
That's great. And just sort of on the hmm. on a similar vein, the roof, I believe in your numbers, you uh, counted replacing asphalt with asphalt and slate with slate, correct? Or you, you were not. Uh, I, b- I believe so. I believe we so. Will ver- we'll verify that. So and I don't know if looking at other alternative materials for slate uh, for the areas where you have slate or maybe less visible portions of slate would affect the cost. And I don't we, know if you looked at that. We, we I do not believe we have, but we can certainly we can certainly provide that number. Well, yeah. OK, great. And then just a question on the exterior masonry. I know that you've been able to tap the ground floor, obviously, and you haven't at the upper floors. Would you say that the upper floors are more vulnerable typically than the lower floors because they're more exposed to weathering or lower floors are because they're exposed, exposed to salts and things coming up from the sidewalk? Or is it kind of, it can be either or? Or is there typically a pattern on a building of sandstone? Our experience is that the higher up, uh, the the methodology of deterioration is water Mm -hmm. saturation, which is always higher at at higher elevations where the wind speed's greater, the general exposure is greater. Uh, We we have not experienced that uh, that the splashing from uh, from de-icing salts and such is going to be a, a major contributor. So I would absolutely agree, uh, Chairman Carroll, with what you just said, that our expectation would be the, the less protected areas, namely the, uh, the areas above the sidewalk shed, would be more exposed and likely will provide more areas of stone that require intervention of some sort. Okay. All right. And then I think my next question is for Mohammed. Um, and sort of getting back to that leaning wall and what's causing it. And I know that you're recommending further probing of the wood trusses, Um, but is there evidence of cracking on the sandstone at the exterior where you would expect to see it if that wall were actually moving out sort of at a a, a unsafe rate of, of movement? Well, I, I, w- I would defer to, to Rick uh, okay, about Rick. What, whether there are signs on the outside because I have not examined the outside personally, but you, you do have some cracking on the inside face of the walls around the round stained glass window, where, where, which would be uh, kind of um, consistent with the lean. So Rick, is there cracking in a location that would be consistent with the lean and, and active movement. Uh, one of the interesting things is the uh, the, the red sandstone uh, surrounding the uh, the large windows uh, is so deteriorated that the, the surface is probably not capable of transmitting the uh, the stress that re- that is necessary to provide a crack. Uh, we haven't seen correlating uh, overstress cracks. In, in the outside sandstone that would suggest that uh, there is an overstress to the, the, uh, the lean of the, of the wall. We see areas that where we might expect that, uh, but there's so deep uh, surface falling that it's hard to make that correlation that the stone was intact sufficiently to transfer the stress and result in a crack. Okay. Okay, and then sort of following up on this, uh, the sort of cracking and and potential causes, we've seen in the various materials that have been submitted to us by the public, different reports with differing opinions about the cause of cracks in the brick. Um, And so what would it take to do more probes to understand the cause and severity of the cracking in the bricks? So for example, um, I think it's been suggested in one of the other reports that the cracks below the bearing point of the metal lintel is a common defect and not evident of a systemic problem and can be ha- addressed with replacing a handful of brick and small scale repairs. So if you can speak to kind of understanding as well as the, the, the further probing that's needed to understand 
the condition of the wood trusses and the exterior sandstone. Can you speak a little bit to the cracking in the bricks and that may be a little of both of you. Mohammed, do you want to take the first crack at that or you want me to? Yeah, I, I, I understood that uh, the cracking in the brick may be referring to um, a different location. Um, it, it may be, you might be referring to... Um, what, I think there are two areas where there are, were identified. Yeah, all right. Facts were identified. Right, so yeah, there were some photos and we did mention in our report um, that um, in, in a different area, not not in on the north south walls, um, yeah, there is um, there are some through cracks, and uh, we don't really need to know more about these. Um, so the, the the photo on on top is is a through crack um, because you can see the crack on the inside face of the wall. Um, and, um, uh, we, we don't really need further investigation here. Uh, we do recommend that, um, the crack be repaired by injecting. Um, so this is, this is a different location than, than where the walls are leaning. Um, uh, this is kind That's of, right. a, this is kind of a location, uh, below a, a lintel. So, uh, it's, it's common here to, to simply seal the crack it's just so that water doesn't continue to infiltrate the wall and create further damage and potential structural uh, issues where the, the brick is really becoming deteriorated further. Um, so that's just one of the recommendations there. Um, the, the photo on the bottom, however, is, is taken in the attic. And the piece of wood that you see on the left is actually an extension of the main truss and uh, what I mentioned before, and what you're actually looking west here, um, and you're, you're looking kind of uh, parallel with the, the walls that are leaning. So uh, this crack in the picture is, is about an inch wide. Um, and, and what that shows to me is, is that the top cord of the truss is, is sort of is sort of pushing outwards along with the, the lean of the walls. And um, it, it just kind of corroborates what we're seeing in general in the attic that the, 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 uh, the wood roof is, is just sort of flexing and, and, and uh, uh, thrusting outwards and, and taking these uh, walls along with them. Okay. All right, and then my last question is about the stained glass windows, which I know is a significant amount of the costs in the estimate estimates. And I think that costs include repair and or replacement of portions of windows. And I know that there are, a lot of them have protective glazing. Some have some that are detached or cracking and some are missing them. And I wondered if, you had it, whether just re repairing to the extent needed to reattach protective glazing would solve the safety issues of the windows and maybe defer the, the restoration of the full restoration of the windows to some other date. Would you get enough life out of them to make that a safe um, phased approach? to just replace uh, the, and fix the protective glazing. Would that address the safety needs and, and defer some of the full restoration costs? Well, the, the, uh, the material, the, the safety material is visible here at, in this photograph on the, the circular window on the outside. Um, that does not address the material on the inside. So there would have to be, I guess, a sandwich yeah. uh, to isolate on both sides the deteriorated stained glass. Um, in, in terms of pure safety, I, I guess the possibility of a uh, deteriorating piece of uh, historic stained glass, uh, if it's 
sandwiched on both sides and basically uh, held in place. I, I, I'm trying to think of an appropriate term, uh, sort of scotch taped in place for, for the time being until it can be addressed more comprehensively. Um, yes, that is sort of an isolating uh, methodology here to try to reduce costs. But um, that's that's a component in the overall uh, the overall situation of the outside of this building, and I think that needs to be emphasized and remembered. That that's that's uh, frankly speaking, that's sort of a small component in the overall uh, situation of the outside of this building. In, in addition, the the at least the exterior one. Uh, light of the protective sandwich, let's call it, it would have to, it would only be as good as the what it's uh, being secured to and anchored to. So it would presuppose right. that the surround is brought to a structural state, at least uh, of, of you know that could resist it. But we likewise we can dig into the estimate and talk and 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 really show you what the uh, you know what that means. You know, put Mike quantify what rick is saying in terms of uh you know uh, the proportion of 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 sort of uh, deferring that to the overall costs of the uh, of the repair okay great thank you well okay all right i think for now those are my questions and we'll, we're going to move on we have uh, commissioner goldblum who will be followed by vice chair bland okay thank you thank you um and please forgive me in advance if some of the things I'm going to ask are, are already in your submission materials. I can't, I did try to get as much of it, get through as much of it as I could, most of it, but I may have missed some things or forgotten some things. So forgive me. Um, if, if, if you, a major component to the budget is the uh, code upgrades uh, required to create the vanilla box suitable for multiple uses. Um, but there are, I'm aware of several examples of, of cases where um, parallel uses are permitted in buildings of this nature, uh, where the uh, religious use is uh, retained uh, while a secondary use uh, is uh, uh, permitted. Um, and in, that in those cases that I'm aware of, the building department has not in the past required complete stem to stern upgrades as long as the overall value of the work did not uh, exceed the thresholds uh, that you know, stated in the code, uh, which are rel relative to the uh, cost of you know, the value of the building itself. So if you separate out the building code upgrades uh, from the restoration costs uh, under the assumption that the church is gonna remain in the building as a co-user, um, how does that affect the overall budget? We um, have uh, in our comments suggested that there are two standards to be met. The first is with regard to continued use of the building as a church. Um, and in that instance, we focus not on the uh, code compliance, but rather on the safety and soundness of the structure. Um, in the case of uh, any change in use of the building, which or would be dominant use, even if a church remained in the building, but if the dominant use of the building was for another purpose, um, a certificate of occupancy would have to be obtained, uh, which the church does not have today. And that CFO would require compliance with all of the code requirements that are currently deficient because of grandfathering. Um, so, uh, if the building, for example, were to be sold, um, then un unless the new purchaser were a church intent on using the building for worship as its primary use, then um, a new CFO would be required and all of the code requirements would have to be met. In particular, I think this is uh, significant in the community house which to bring that structure up to code would require two code compliant fire stairs, a new elevator, the entire building would have to be sprinklered, ADA bathrooms would have to be installed and so forth. Um, 
it's it's unimaginable to me that you could achieve any of that without basically gutting the interior, the entire interior of the building. Um, I'm not I'm not questioning anything that you say, but you're not answering my question. My question was: if you presume that a religious use is a user of this building going forward, whether it's Presbyterian or Muslim or, or something else, um, and the religious use is maintained such that a CFO either could be obtained under a uh, legacy application or, in, or no CFO was needed depending on the kind of work, I'm asking you to bracket off and not include uh, the code upgrades that you incorporate into your budget, how would that affect your budget? Um, we, we haven't done a detailed breakout of that, although we intend to do so. We're happy to provide you with that analysis uh, as soon as we've been able to finish it. A uh, you know, major component of that obviously is the north and south walls, which we're trying to get to the bottom of now. Right. Uh, no matter what use of the building, whether it's for religious or other purposes, those structural concerns would have to be addressed. So we want to be able to break those out. Right. I think that's a very important aspect of this process because you know if the process is hinging on a financial argument uh, to, to justify the uh, requirements of the law, then I think looking at the financial aspects and certainly a big component like that is, is worth looking at. And having a religious use remain in this building as a principal use is not out of the question. Um, second, um, and again, forgive me if I missed this in the, in the documents. I, I understand uh, the, and, and let, let's assume for the sake of discussion that the assessments that uh, uh, Facade MD made were 100% correct. In the budgeting, how much um, did the budget accommodate um, uh, cementitious repairs, of the type normally done on brownstones in the city to masonry versus replacements versus Dutchman's versus, uh, you, you already said that, 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 that there was not a, a number integrated into the budget for alternate material cast, cast stone, but um, how much of the budget was assuming non-stone repairs over the percentage of stone deemed estimated necessary for repair. Roger, do you want me to step in on that? Yes, please. Okay, hi, so I'm James, James Brand, I'm a Senior Vice President of Leading Builders and I've been helping out preparing the estimates here. Uh, so I would have to go back and actually pull apart the detail to give you a, a number, which I made a note to myself, we can look into that. But generally speaking, those, the quantities uh, were generated by uh, Facade MD, gave us a report of approximate repair quantities. That estimate of quantities went to a facade restoration, someone who specialized in facade restoration who put a price to each type of repair and the quantity of repairs. So um, that's how we came up with our number. So maybe Rick, would yeah. you know? So, so basically what you're saying is that of the four options that Facade MD identified as potential repair options, you believe that your subcontractor made an estimate of X percent for option A, X percent for option B. Is that what you're saying? Or my, my recollection of, of, no. of the estimate no. was that it was, it was mostly stone replacement. I don't remember seeing a line item for uh, cementitious repair or things like that. Yes, you are. Rick, you are Rick go ahead. Yeah, you are correct, Commissioner. I have a 17 page document from December where <laughs> most of the repairs, most of the uh, addressing, most of the, the four categories of how to address a deteriorated piece of stone, most of it is replace or, or a Dutchman repair. There's very little uh, in terms of. Uh, patching or replace with cast stone. Uh, why? why? Uh, primarily because uh, the uh, LPC rules from a few years ago were, were leaning us towards repair or replacement in kind. And, and that was the basis of our first estimate. 
was replacing uh, on an individual landmark that's uh, below seven stories, trying to keep uh, replacement in kind at the forefront. Great. Uh, I, I would suggest that it would probably be in the public interest, given the dire nature of this application, that the team uh, consider extensive use of alternate materials um, because I'm just one commissioner, but I, I'll tell you, if you gave me the choice of a cementitious repair versus tearing it down, I know where I'd vote. So I think that there might be others who have similar feelings. So I think it would be worthwhile present a budget that is not best versus demolish. Um, let's see, in terms of uses, can, can you guys talk a little bit about the Hiller letter, um, which uh, basically made um, the statement that uh, because of the lease arrangement with the subtenant, uh, that it would be illegal or impossible for you to uh, uh, do what you're planning to do anyway. Did you talk about that? I'm not sure what Hiller was getting to, but the current lease with the center at West Park uh, expires on December 31, 2022. Um, and it is not the intention of the church to extend that lease because it can no longer continue to subsidize the operations in the center as it has in the past because it's out of money. Uh, and it doesn't have the financial resources to continue to assume responsibility for the maintenance of the building. And there is growing concern about the sustainability of the structure uh, over the long term or even over the near term. Um, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure where he's going with that, but uh, you know. Right. The, and how about, how about the sale of, of air rights? Were there any um, air rights uh, Sale, um, um, sales considered? Uh, there was a submission that described uh, the, the uh, requirements for the sale of air rights. Uh, it had, we analyzed what it would take for receiving sites to be able to um, acquire those rights. We can say that over time, there have been on a couple of occasions, approaches uh, made to the church by buildings that are adjacent to the structure with the idea of buying the air rights so that they could not be used on the site. Um, that's happened on at least two occasions. Um, in both of those occasions, the amount of funds that would have been raised from the purchase would not have been sufficient to begin even a partial restoration of the building. Uh, but for How much? I think one was for a million dollars and another was for a million five. I, I want to verify those numbers because I don't have them in front of me. But they were a small fraction of what the theoretical value of the air rights would be, which was uh, presumptive of the very the, the vir virtual impossibility of finding uh, a buyer for the existing air rights. Uh, among the eligible structures that are either adjacent or across the intersection or across the street. Got it. Um, last question. Has the church explored um, partnering with other companies that might have a uh, use for the building and would be able to pay for it? Uh, we, uh, you know, obviously Cipriani is, a, is an example of two, two very remarkable, three very remarkable spaces that are landmark. Uh, that have been um, put to use. Uh, we, we just saw at the commission, the, muse the Children's Museum taking a, a church up the a couple of blocks from your site. Have there been attempts to, uh, I mean, certainly the theater has alleged that it was it offered to buy the, the building. Um, uh, have there been efforts that have been documented as part of this application to show that that there are no partnerships available, there are no interested parties willing to invest what's needed in the building to improve it and allow for the church to remain in some fashion? Sure. Um, in uh, 2012, the church engaged <coughs> Wakefield to do an analysis uh, exactly as you described, which was to find tenants for the space that would be willing to in invest in the property, if you will, 
but also partners who could share in the maintenance of the space and perhaps even share in ownership of the property. Um, those uh, discussions and, and uh, marketing efforts continued for well over a year. Um, <clears throat> and there were no uh, viable candidates that were uncovered. There were a, a number of entities that were uh, where conversations began, including Joffrey Ballet and, some, Ballet and some others. But the overall condition of the building and the landmark status of the building made it really impossible to find a partner along those lines. With respect to the offer from the center at West Park, um, I think it would be gratuitous at best to consider that a serious offer given their uh, position with regard to our application. But at no time have we heard any conversations from the center at West Park with regard to how they would address the certificate of occupancy concerns. It's clear that if the property were sold to center at West Park, a CFO would be required. There would be a new uh, substantial use of the building and all of the code uh, requirements, both the ADA, fire, and other would have to be brought up to speed and all the outstanding DOB violations would have to be cleared before you could, uh, before right. you would issue a CFO. Well, but um, I guess my question, I thank you for that answer and, and um, I, I have two responses to it. First of all, in terms of the marketing effort, um, I would say that 2012 was the vantage point of 2022, it feels like a century ago. Mm -hmm. uh, so it might it might behoove us at this juncture to uh, reopen that exploration. Um, and um, secondly, I don't see why you would care at all for the for the for another buyer's burdens. Uh, it's very charitable, but it's it's frankly who cares? That's their problem. Why do you? you know, why would that? that issue about requiring a CFO and, and code upgrades be your problem if they paid you enough to uh, buy the building from you? Well, first of all, the, the, the offer that was submitted was a conditional offer. It was subject to due diligence <clears throat> on their review, which I assume was an opportunity to give them a chance to determine if they could raise the funds needed to be able to make the purchase, uh, given that they have no available funds on, uh, of their own today. Um, I think any conversation about raising funds to buy the building would be um, disingenuous without considering what it would cost to actually be able to use the building after you bought it. Well, I mean, I think that um, whether one is talking about the theater tenant or someone else, in the end, that's their problem. And um, you're accepting an offer to purchase the building whether it's a dollar or $15 million is a way to transfer the burden of all of this, including, you know, the landmark designation status travels with the building. And when one buys the building for whatever price one buys it for, one buys its problems and its legal restrictions with the purchase of the bricks and the mortar. So I think that have, you know, it, seem, it seems to me that having a litmus test uh, 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 in uh, limiting the possibility of selling the building, if that's what you're interested in doing, is kind of counterproductive. Who knows? The guy who's proposing to build a 30-story building might run out of money at floor 15. It's happened. Uh, you know, that's really not, I think, you know, necessarily germane to the consideration, but that it's your business, you can sell the building to whoever you want to, I guess. But it seems like an, you're setting a bar very high and I guess I wonder uh, how that affects this deliberation because basically you're ruling out what some would consider to be a reasonable option for saving the building because of, you know, that, that, that's what allows me to consider the motives or the, the, the criteria for considering this? Um, two comments. Uh, first, uh, it was reported in the paper today, I believe, that um, there was this offer and that the church has never responded to it. In fact, the church did respond to their offer in writing. 
Uh, and the response was basically that uh, we thank them for their offer, but we have entered into a contract with another buyer. And until we've been able to determine the status of that sale, we're not in a position to enter into discussions with any other prospective buyer. Um, the other point, uh, which I think is uh, valid, which is this notion that the the efforts to find a partner back in 2012 was a life, a seemingly a lifetime ago. But I would say that not too many years after that, going back to uh, 2016, we entered into a partnership, if you will, or a relationship with Center West Park that was intended to, to create this sort of vehicle for uh, uh, generating additional space use income and also a, a non-church entity that would be more successful or potentially more successful at raising funds for restoration of the building. Uh, that relationship has been going on for over five years. And unfortunately, so far at least, it hasn't generated the kind of funding that we had hoped originally. But I think Very because of, I think of that sorry. relationship has sort of made it difficult to you know, enter into ancillary conversations with others away from, away from the center. If, if, I can, if I can add something, um, I do think you should look at the letter from the broker um, that is included in the July 15th package, which talks a lot about um, whether this building is marketable in its current condition. And I would also say that the um, that if the church um, is able to demonstrate under the statutory criteria set forth in the landmarks law that it is a hardship, that there is nothing in that statute that would then require them to basically sell the property to the lowest bidder. Um, so I, that, I, I understood that, but it, it sounded like they, you know, they, they have entered into an agreement to sell it and they're not required to, but it's certainly something that's on the table and, you know, the, our job is to try to save buildings and um, therefore these, these uh, reviews are looked at with great care. Um, so if somebody is ruling out what seems to be someone knocking at the door with a big wallet, it's, it's uh, certainly worthy of a question. I, I would not characterize um, the current offer as a big wallet, certainly. I, nor was I characterizing that particular offer in any way. Thank you. Okay, great. And, you know, as I said in the beginning today, we we're focusing largely on the condition of the building as that gets to the heart of the costs that uh, affect the financial analysis. These questions are all good, but I want you to know we will at subsequent public meetings have more information on the financial analysis and guidance on how to review that. So it's fine to ask the questions now, it lays the groundwork, but we will have further um, consideration, evaluation, guidance, and answers at subsequent public meetings on some of these topics. Um, and then before I move to Commissioner Bland, I just want to ask Mark if you want to address the letter we received regarding the lease. Yeah, um, so um, uh, Roger and, and the team, um, yesterday we received a letter from uh, Michael Hill representing the center. Uh, you have not seen that yet, but the issue that he raised in this letter um, is that the uh, center in February of this year exercised its option to um, continue the lease for another five years. So I know you haven't seen the letter um, and uh, you'll get a copy and you'll have plenty of time to um, obviously respond. But that, that is what uh, uh, Commissioner Goldblum was referring to was the, uh, the, uh, alleg uh, the statement that the lease in fact does not end in uh, the end of this year, but goes until 2028. Mark, without going into detail about a letter I haven't seen, I would Correct, say yeah. to you that we, we did receive a notice from the center earlier this year uh, indicating their desire to extend the lease for an additional five years. We responded to that uh, notice with a letter from our council pointing out that um, an extension of the lease without the consent of the church would be a violation of New York state law and that there is no basis or validity to their 
um, extension, and we are prepared to litigate that matter. Okay, they, they have, uh, so we will obviously, we will be providing you this letter, but they uh, reference, I guess, those arguments uh, without stating that they had gotten a response from you. Um, they do reference those arguments in their letter, so you can, you'll have plenty of time to respond to them. And, and I would say that we have responded uh, in writing from our council. We received a response from them to that correspondence from uh, another attorney, not Hiller, but another attorney, um, which suggested that they, you know, took exception to our view, but that they wished to meet with us to discuss whether or not there was some reasonable basis for uh, agreement. We tried for over a month to try and uh, meet with them on that matter. We were rebuffed. Uh, and so that conversation never took place. Um, and so that issue is, you know, clearly unresolved at this point. Okay, well, we'll look forward to sort of uh, getting your side of that, of that, uh, those events. Okay, thank you. So we'll move to uh, Vice Chair Bland, followed by Commissioner Shamir Barron. Uh, thank you. My question will take a different tact. Um, we've had uh, uh, probing questions of a very technical nature. I will now, uh, by commissioners who have that knowledge, I, I don't possess that sort of knowledge, and we'll take this other tact, um, and we'll use an analogy, two analogies, one sort of um, ad hoc and the other one more professional. Um, the, the ad hoc one is, um, I know so many people, including myself, who have over time bought uh, historic houses that we could not uh, at that moment uh, deal with economically, but we chopped it into pieces. And over time, we made the improvements that we needed to make uh, to prolong the life of the, um, of, of the building. Uh, um, and in my case, uh, over 42 years now of, of, of raising a family in that building. Uh, so that's the way we did it. Now, professionally, my firm has represented um, many institutions which have um, historic buildings, uh, including many churches. Um, and most of these churches can't also deal with uh, their burden of, uh, of, of keeping up their buildings often and mostly in historic districts or even uh, uh, individual landmarks. So we have uh, provided a master plan or an approach to how that building can be maintained over time. And that takes into account um, uh, resources that the institution might have and the priority of need that the building itself exhibits. And I'm wondering if there was a time, uh, let's say over, over the recent years, maybe 15 or 20 years, when uh, this church operated under that sort of guise, uh, with a with a you know with a long term plan for for maintenance, so that's my question. Do you ever do that, or it, it seems to me as if you let things mount up to such a degree that it's now this overwhelming problem? If if I could make a couple, one response to that. Um, as, as you recall, this building was designated 12 years ago, and it was designated over the objections of the congregation for many of the conditions, reasons that um, we're discussing today. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, the congregation knew that it did not have the resources um, to repair the building and to maintain it. and. Um, and in fact, had been in discussions, uh, fairly detailed discussions that would have required a, a tower was going to be constructed on a portion of the community house that also extended a little bit into the sanctuary. And um, it was hoped that that would provide funding that would allow for the restoration of the church. That developer walked away when the building was calendared and designated because they, um, didn't see how they could um, proceed uh, with a, uh, an individually designated landmark. Um, and at the time of designation, I think knowing that there were very um, 
that there weren't enough resources, there were a number of people, including neighbors and elected officials who made a lot of promises about helping the church and raising resources. And for the most part, those promises were never met. Uh, there was very little money um, that was generated um, for the church and the church basically expended all of its resources taking, um, dealing with the immediate needs of the church. And so right now they're simply out of money. There's no more money. So it is, um, you know, a phased restoration at, at this point based on the resources that the church has currently is really not an option. I mean, I think, you know, Roger can expand on that, but um, they can't afford to maintain the building, um, you know, even in its current condition, let alone respond to the Department of Buildings violations and to do the restoration work and potentially the structural repairs that this building needs. I, I guess my, my, my question at the heart of my question is really, how much is this self-inflicted? Um, that's, that's the heart of my question. And I'll, I'll go mute again because I don't need to engage. I just wanted some sort of a discussion about this topic, which has been bugging me for some time now that I've been thinking about it. All right, uh, we'll go to Commissioner Shamir Barron. Thank you, Chair Carroll. Um, uh, and like Michael, um, I'll ask for forgiveness if, if in fact you've covered a lot of um, this and I somehow missed it. I know that there were references to light and air and, um, but I do wanna ask you to spend a few minutes and talk to us about um, considerations and planning that may have occurred already um, been considered anyway, um, for not exactly an adaptive reuse, but for another kind of development project. Um, the project that comes to mind that we, the commission saw and, um, and approved after uh, a, a lot of input and a lot of, a lot of work um, was, is the Park Avenue Christian Church at 1010 Park Avenue, where um, there was in fact, I mean, it, it's, it's in, in many ways, not at all like this project, but, where um, a development of, uh, of a tall building occurred and happened a, within the kind of the, the domain of the, of the building itself. And some pieces were lost, um, interior and otherwise, but it was a, it was a, a way in which to, to, um, to bring the required funds for the restoration of the rest of the church and to fulfill the mission of the congregation of the community to um, to, to profit to, to be able to live in the long term with the asset. So, I, I want to understand, um, I, and I understand that there you've talked a little bit about it. There are some constraints, um, but how much exactly you have explored, or the developers explored, in partnership with the congregation, um, a possibility of a development that actually occupies the building in some way. Um, retains very a, a good amount of its facade, rebuilds lots of its facade, and potentially um, adaptively reuses some of its interior functions. Yeah, uh, hi, Commissioner. I'll, I'll Dan Kaplan. I'll start by addressing this, and, and perhaps uh, Ken Horn can can follow up. So there are two scenarios we looked to in depth. Um, one was uh, an adaptive reuse of the building for converting to residential use um, without any overbuild, but inserting um, slabs into the building. Um, th th they're um, high level uh, there. The operation that would be required on the building would be a carving in of two rear yards and courts. Um, Toby, maybe you can go to that slide. Um, so on the left is the existing condition. On the right is uh, um, would be post uh, court demolition. So there'd be a larger interior court in the middle and a smaller rear yard uh, to the right. And then that would be operation sort of 1A and 1B. And operation 2 would be inserting slabs into the building. Uh, uh, we 
with, you know, the trick here is going to be utilizing the existing windows to the greatest extent. Um, and so we uh, figured that we could get four slabs uh, levels in. And then um, basically once that was done to cut in new windows to allow for legal light and air and just marketability light and air. Uh, and so uh, this slide shows the existing fenestration, which if memory serves is, is about 10% of the wall and something this would be about 22% of the wall, including a lot of uh, roof, roof windows. So it would require extensive renovation. Then, so we took that, um, Adam Wall then did an appraisal of that um, and that's in the report. Um, uh, it uh, it is um, he, he can opine on that. the the, the second the, the second scenario we looked at was, and we looked at a, a number, but this was seemed the, the closest to viability, and it's and it doesn't appear to be viable. Was to um, retain the sanctuary you know the building was built in two parts the the building on the left which is a sanctuary that then and prior to that the the parish house and then everything was reclad so we um uh we we uh, this proposal demolishes the parish house puts in a, a an elevator and then maybe you can go to the three-dimensional view because i think that's the most telling uh yeah so this is in current zoning what it would yield it was a very um it was, I mean, it, it was a small amount of sellable floor area, even with the cantilever, which is awkward. Um, and then, uh, I don't know if it's in this deck, but then if there were a, um, you know, this is a sliver building. And if there were a waiver to the sliver law, we could do that, um, which would require BSA approval. But even those two together yield about, uh, again, it's in the report, but if memory serves about, you know, less than 50% of the available floor area of the building. And I believe it's in the complications of building that building um, and the minimal yield would, would not, uh, it would be not be viable for economically, but that's, so we did, but, but summary is we did look at both of them. Do we have, if, if I can add a little bit to that, yeah. um, you know, we, we've been involved in this project now for probably a year and a half. And uh, you know, my firm has done. Can please work. identify yourself. Oh, I'm Kenneth Horn. I'm the president of Alchemy Properties. So we have been involved in this project now for probably about a year and a half when Roger and his team brought us in. And, you know, our background is I've been doing development now in, for 30 years in New York. We just finished the Woolworth building, um, which I'm sure uh, many of you know was really a grand dame of a landmark building in New York. And we spent a lot of time and a lot of care and a lot of effort making sure that was done correctly. We're finishing up another landmark project at 378 West End. Um, and we became involved in this. Frankly, we didn't even know what a hardship application was. I, I've been doing this a long time. I, I'm a lawyer as well. I had no idea what a hardship application was. And when we became involved, the concept was to try to make use of the existing facility and make use of the air rights above it. And part and parcel of that was to bring in Dan and his team, Rick Lefebvre and his team, and Mohammed, who we've worked with extensively over the years. And the more we became involved in it, we realized that the physical plant made it impossible for us to implement making use of the existing church as a basis to build additional square footage. And I think that's important to point out in terms of this analysis is there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of innuendo and a lot of bravado about the fact that the church and alchemy conspired to move ahead with a hardship application without much care with regard to the landmark. There is nothing farther from the truth. We spent six to eight months looking at every aspect of this building in terms, terms of trying to maintain it so we could make use of the air rights above it. But the more we became involved, the physical stresses of the building, the lack of ability to make use of the lower portion without thoroughly butchering the facade in terms of the fenestration that was required to make legal light in there, almost made the building itself be landmarked. Because even if we were successful in terms of the implementation of what we're seeing on the screen now, 
How is that helpful in terms of maintaining the church and its landmark status? So I think it's important to point out that although the commissioners have come up with very good questions and very good concepts in terms of analyzing every brick and analyzing the ability to transfer air rights, the church has no money to do any of this. They are out of money. And you know, frankly, we have exhausted every scenario in terms of trying to figure out how to maintain this building from a financial point of view so that the building can remain. Um, and I can't stress that more because, you know, I've been sitting here listening to a lot of the comments and listening to the fact that this was benign neglect on behalf of the church. Nothing could be farther from the truth. The church sold their manse. They used every dollar they had to try to maintain this structure. And it's just not feasible. So although a lot of the plans that have been suggested in terms of analysis, in terms of looking at this, in terms of replacing stones and replacing bricks, and, and looking at the mortar are interesting for, to pursue. The question is, how do they get paid for? And that's the, whole pur- that's the whole purpose of the application is that the church is out of money. And to be in a position where it's suggested that the church perhaps sell the asset for considerably less than it could be worth, I, I don't understand why that's even a viable option here. Um, you know, in terms of trying to force the church into selling an asset that just can fetch the church and its mission considerably more money going forward. So, you know, again, I just stress that I've been doing this for a long time. We examined every conceivable means of maintaining the church. And based on Severo's report, Rick Lefebvre's report, CCI's report, and every report that we've gotten, it's a disaster to try to do that financially. And if you look at what we produced here, you know, we, we are chopping this building up to such a degree that it will never resemble anything similar to what it was you know, 50 years ago when it was in much better condition. Thank Val, you. I was you, asking a question. I wonder if I could just ask Al to comment on the Park Avenue Christian uh, example. Right. So, yeah, I, d- I did actually want to comment on Park Avenue Christian because I'm fairly familiar with that building. Park Avenue Christian was um, in a historic district. It was in the Park Avenue Historic District. Um, it had the church itself uh, was considered contributing within the district. The annex, um, which was sort of their former community house, had been uh, pretty drastically altered in 1963 and was considered non-contributing. So that was basically the footprint for the new building, which the commission had to find appropriate in terms of its design. Um, but the demolition uh, was not was not an issue there, and and that annex was not sort of structurally as structurally tied with the um, rest of, of the church because it had been so altered in 1963. But a couple of significant differences was that the development side for Park Ave, the tower beside Park Avenue Christian uh, was 45 feet wide. So it was not subject to the sliver law. And um, the depth of the site also was deeper. It was about 133 feet deep as opposed to 100 feet deep. So there was a lot more sort of flexibility um, in that case uh, to develop a viable residential building beside the church. And so, but did you conclude that scenario two was not possible, um, not permissible, not um, not actually doable, or just that it didn't, it, it wasn't as economically um, positive. I think they, it did not, um, and the financial analysis, it did not generate a reasonable return. It will also, and I think Dan can speak to this, because of the construction um, cost, it was a very inefficient building and um, would not really yield uh, very uh, usable or attractive um, residential floor plans. But Dan, maybe you can add. 
Dan, would you like to talk about sort of the structural underpinnings of building? Sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, I would just say that there are um, three, three points to this. One is the um, inefficiency or the, of the floor um, or the arrangement, and that is it's a very tight floor plate. It, you know, it's basically... 31 feet by 70 feet in depth and you know to that you need to get you know a, a scissor stair even if they're one elevator but we're showing two because it's you know this would be to get the the you know the type of return you know of sales that or, or rents that you would need it would have to be a two elevator building and then you know the the required trash chutes etc you're left it's enormously inefficient um and i and and the numbers the quantity of this is all in in the report i don't have it to the tip of my fingers but it, it was it was you know i believe it was you know yielded just a, like in the 60 percent range which is very low the second is the desirability of the of the space that is created um, you can see here in this floor plan which is um, the majority of them there's really only uh, legal light and air on on the north and the south it's slowed down it's not um, you know this isn't uh, uh, great mm, space and then it uh, you know there are many ways to organize a core we've dealt with many of them um, it's I've been hard pressed to really be able to utilize the space very well and then third uh, is really just the construction cost if Toby maybe you can go to the to the 3d you know it, you know so we it, it's really building something like this is you know certainly possible um, and um, more sort of um, adventurous and and delicate construction has been created but it's very expensive to do so and yeah, so Canada, here you have the underpinning of the adjacent buildings and the go, go ahead ken yeah, if i remember correctly yeah. I think the loss factor here was close to 40 percent yes yes thank so you. hypothetically for every yeah. thousand feet that you build you're only selling or renting 600 feet that's Correct. not a recipe for a successful development especially with the complications, as Dan pointed out, of having to underpin the building to the east, uh, closing up the lot line windows. And the cantilevers, of course, the more you cantilever, the more expensive it becomes in terms of your physical structure. Um, so, I mean, we've, I mean, we looked at this, Dan, I, I will say we looked at 20 different variations on the theme in terms of potentially even trying to keep the lower portion of the existing sanctuary and building above it and trying to figure out where we could anchor a structure through the roof. And we were literally tore our proverbial hair out of our head to try to figure this out, but nothing really worked because of the structural limitations of the existing building and the facade issues. Um, but this particular scenario too, it, it's, first of all, it's not an attractive building, that's number one. And secondly, just the, the lack of, um, floor area, net rentable and net saleable floor area you're creating makes the physical construction of the building impossible. It just doesn't work economically. And is that, does that include the costs of stabilizing and restoring the sanctuary building as well? Yeah, I mean, look, we've, you know, we've, if you guys look at the building we just did at 378 West End, similar scenario, but the exception is we actually took the wall down on the landmark building to stabilize it. That was easier than doing this because at least we're able to tie the two buildings together as opposed to dealing with a building that we wouldn't have a joint ownership of. Um, this is a very difficult construction, especially as Dan pointed out, a 31 foot building is very, very small. And even if BSA gave you consent, I mean, look at the map. If you have 31 feet and you're putting in two staircases an elevator um, and a lobby, your loss factor on your lower floors is just, it's just remarkable. Um, and again, this does not lead to a very attractive structure by any means and one that is just course prohibitive to build. Okay, is there a follow-up question, Commissioner Shamir Barron? 
No, um, I have other questions that Great. have to do with Please the tree, but not right. I think it, I should save those for a little bit later because they're not really related to the, uh, they're more financial questions for later. So I will wait. Thank you. Thanks. All right, other questions? Okay, I don't, oh, oops, Commissioner Jefferson, do you have a question? Did you wanna? We are mute. <laughs> I, I have two questions or three, and they have to do with the sandstone, and they have to do with time. If this structure was left in its present condition, how long would it take for it to completely decay and be unusable? Hmm. I think the first question, the first part of the answer to that uh, relates to the north and south walls. Um, we, we do know that they are both moving outward. What we don't know now because we don't have sufficient information is whether that's taken place over years or decades or whether this is a more recent development. Uh, and that's why we've installed the tilt beams to be able to measure the current rate of movement. If that rate of movement is high, then I think the answer to your question is that it's a pretty short time frame. Um, if if the walls are somehow stable and are no longer moving, uh, that gives us a, a different time frame, and that speaks, I think, more to your principal question, which is the condition of the facade itself. I would defer to Rick with respect to the latter. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Roger. Uh, in terms of what data do we have currently? The, the sidewalk shed's been up for uh, more than 20 years. And my assumption, uh, I, I guess just based on pure logic, is that the sidewalk shed went up uh, shortly uh, around the same time as the, the cementitious repairs were done. Uh, my understanding of the situation is that the building was sort of quote unquote made safe. Areas were scraped down, areas of deteriorated sandstone and, and uh, repairs were made, including this cementitious mortar installation uh, about 20 years ago. Uh, and we're back, right back where we were 20 years ago, in fact, probably even worse. So extrapolating into the future with the, uh, the, the corrosion curve, uh, concept, which is as things begin to deteriorate, uh, the rate of deterioration accelerates. Uh, I would say that uh, if nothing were done to this building, it would be considerably less than 20 years before uh, a lot of additional repairs would need to be done. And frankly, if the same level of intervention, basically scraping down the material that's in poor condition now, only until it was quote unquote uh, safe, uh, we would have in, in approximately 20 years or less than 20 years, a similar level of deterioration. That's my professional opinion. Okay. Um, the second question then is, if the program of preventive, conservice, preventive conservice, conservation was implemented, what would be a reasonable time to complete the stone restoration and remove the scaffolding. So how long would that take to perform that task? To put the pipe frames, the pipe staging in place and do a physical examination stone by stone. And, and, and re replace everything, how long would that take? Two years, three years, four years? And replace everything. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure that would be a period of years. Uh, I would have to look into it more carefully to give you a, a reasonable estimate. Perhaps uh, James might have some input. Uh, sure. We had looked at rough timelines and schedules and assumed it would be 24 to 30 months, but that's continuous flow of operations. You just so, so two have years. the funding and just two plus years to do all this work. Yes. Okay. The exterior, the facade. Okay. So my third question was, was, was I think was asked before has to do with the percentage uh, 
estimated material, but we have a range of that. So you're doing that analysis so we'll know in the future what range of, uh, of material you would use. So the takeaway from this is that in 40 years, nothing would be left, it would be pretty much damaged. And in two and a half years, if we decided to restore this, it would take two and a half years. Is that pretty much an answer that I'm getting? A summary of that? I, I, I'm afraid I'm not really following your, your, your point. Okay, my point is, if it's gonna, if we leave it as is, in 40 years, it will be unsalvageable. And in two and a half years, we can save this. So there's a question of time and effort. And that's what I'm trying to get at, is what, what the relationship between two. Um, and I, so you've, you've answered my question, but it, it, I'm pleased that I've answered it because I really still don't quite understand it. But, uh, okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right, Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, sir. I thought you were going around the table, uh, but it's uh, uh, Commissioners uh, Hubbard Smith and Devonshire have answered, uh, you know, a lot of the structural questions I had, and uh, some of the financial and use questions were answered by the questions of Commissioner Goldblum and Commissioner Barron. So I have just a couple more uh, questions. One was. There was something said at some point in testimony or by the applicant about an interest expressed by other congregations or churches. Uh, I'd like to know if, uh, if that occurred and if so, approximately when. And I understand they might have been, you know, decided not to pursue matters uh, for financial or other considerations. So that's my first question. Uh, I believe there were discussions with a synagogue um, and uh, perhaps one other church. I think most of those predate the engagement with the center at West Park. Uh, some of those discussions went pretty far along, but ultimately the cost of repairing the building and the landmark status of the building caused those, um, those discussions to terminate. So they never... We, we did have discussions along those lines, but we were never able to move them to the point where we were able to enter into a serious negotiation. Uh, thank you. Um, I, also, I think there was mention made of a mortgage. Is there an existing mortgage and what's the amount? Maybe that's in your document somewhere, but I haven't seen it. There's no mortgage on the building at this point. Thank you, thank you, that's helpful. Um, and let's see. Um, this is a more structural question. Uh, the necessity of the interior uh, concrete fireproof uh, structure. Uh, that is really, how necessary is it for which purposes, so to speak? Um, which, uh, I which option? Uh, I, uh, Commissioner, I think you're referring to the adaptive reuse scenario. Yes. I think where, so. yes. So, um, uh, we, we believe that, um, most likely, uh, um, structural technique for infilling the floors would be a, um, precast reinforced concrete because, you know, you can do the formwork and then pour, pour it in, you know, uh, as opposed to lifting large pieces of steel and so forth into the building. But I, I in either case, um, uh, uh, you know, it's less than, um, I believe four stories. So I, I don't know, you know, could it be made out of, out of wood framing or, or protected, you know, wood framing possibly. Mm -hmm. Um, but, uh, I don't think that would change the, the calculus significantly. And I should add that if you're, if you're adding to the top in terms of any kind of structure above it, yeah. The fire rating below can't be less than the fire rating right. above. Right. But so I, hypothetically, yeah. if you are even keeping this scenario one that Dan has up on the screen now and you added anything above it, then you could you could not do the lower portion in a in wood. You'd have to do it in 
semantitious yeah. board. So you'd have to keep it. Right. Yeah, you right. could fireproof so, the board. So right. yeah, yeah. I mean, the 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 real the the, the headline is here. I, I you know I think it's the the construction of the floor slab itself, whether it's precast concrete, whether it's a fire protected wood, whether it's, you know, uh, light gauge, you know, whether it's light gauge steel framing, it, 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 it's not really, um, I, I don't think it will have really any significant impact on, on the, on the analysis. Thank you. I, I, I understand. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Um, I, I, and note that it seems that a, a lot of the damage to the church appears well has been water penetration, one fashion or another. Whether it's the flashings and spouts of the the type of mortar that was used, and the uh, even the application of some waterproofing over time, and so on. Uh, so that would be part that, in particular, those aspects would be part of the. Uh, as well as removing any loose material, the, the, shall we say, most emergency repairs needed, I assume, to, you know, make sure that you, you address the waterproofing issues. Keeping water out of a uh, historic building <coughs> is uh, obviously a primary concern. Yes, Commissioner. Okay. Um, Oh, I just wanted to remark, sir, that uh, I was out of town, un un unable to attend the initial site visits, but I have visited the site myself, and obviously I've reviewed all the available engineering reports. So thank you. That's, that's it for now. Okay, thank you. All right, are there any other questions, commissioners? All right, I'm not seeing any other hands. I do want to turn to Mark Silberman and see if we have questions from the staff, legal or preservation staff that we want to cover for the point of clarifying and getting information on the record today. Mark? Thank you, Sarah. I do have some questions and we will be providing uh, the applicant with a list of questions, some of which uh, were, were asked uh, already, but we'll be providing that list um, shortly. Um, but I just want to just to follow up on a few things, just so we're, the record is clear, with respect to the stained glass, it, it's my understanding that that um, facade and D's investigation was based on an exterior um, review. And I'm just going back to what the chair was asking: where there is protective glazing over the stained glass window, what is the basis for the level of work, which is quite extensive on most of these stained glass windows? for the estimate in the budget if if uh, basically you were looking through the um, protective glazing and not really uh, uh, and analyzing the windows themselves sorry i i'm i'm leasing through our 17 page uh quantity analysis for uh, some specific information regarding the, st the uh, stained glass. So Rick, uh, you can the, provide uh, this. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Yeah, we can look into it. In, in the nine we'll, page. We'll look into there, it, yeah. We'll look I, into I, it because that. I don't want to keep you waiting here in a public hearing, so. We'll look into it and respond. Okay, and I'll include that in the list of questions. Um, secondly, um, it's my understanding that um, Facade B and Severud uh, were first looked at the building in November um, of 2021. That's the dates of your report, your initial reports. Um, subsequent to that, Facade MD, um, you were concerned enough that you reported the conditions to the DOB about the facade and the DOB violations were issued. Um, and I know that some of, those, some of those violations dealt with the structural issues and others dealt with facade, the general facade uh, conditions that you were concerned about. But I just wanna clarify and confirm that as of this moment in time, DOB has not set any particular scope of work 
other than the structural stuff for you that is required to be done. And, and so I just want to make sure that, that the record is clear. That's my understanding. And I just want to uh, make sure that's correct. The structural side of things was completed per the DOB's right. request. That was completed uh, between the uh, between Christmas and, and, and New Year's of, of last year, and that had to do with a, an emergency condition with the with the south wall, where the south wall was was unbraced between the mezzanine and the um, the, uh, right. the finial. So so that condition has already been addressed, but uh, that that condition i just want to make clear that that did not address the lean in the wall it i understand simply addressed that. the fact yeah. that it was unbraced I right think, right I think the but, answer, but in terms but, of the facade in terms of the, the the outstanding violations i just, just in terms of the condition of the stone the the dob has not um prescribed any any particular level of response they've just they've just recognize that you've identified some conditions, um, but they have not said that you need to replace five stones or a hundred stones or whatever. Is that correct? In their violation, they uh, cited a concern over the overall safety of the facade, but the only specific element that they cited was the finial that was located at the right. pinnacle of the roof on the community yeah. house, which we have subsequently removed. Right. Um, but I believe that's correct. We have repeatedly attempted to get guidance from DOB as to the, the specific type of work they feel needs to be done in order to lift the violations. There are two violations on that point that are still outstanding and we really have not received that guidance. Okay, I, I just I just wanna make sure the record's clear. Um, secondly, also, um, so um, Dan, I think when you were talking about the, the redevelopment scenario, scenario two, it, it's my recollection that, that um, uh, the appra appraisers and planners did not, in fact, do an analysis of the feasibility of that scenario, that they just did the three main ones. Um, That's and so, correct. Okay. All right. I just, That's correct. Um, and lastly, um, Roger, when, with respect to the discussions about the things that happened in 2012 and the discussion subsequently with the synagogue and the... Um, uh, apparently there may have been another church about um, we, we, you've represented that people were, were um, the, the, the landmark status was, was one of the reasons why people were, were um, not interested. And I'm just wondering, were you actually part of those discussions or is there someone who was um, and what's the basis of your, of those statements? I was, I was not a part of those discussions. Uh, that was, I was, uh, paraphrasing what was communicated to me by the people who were, uh, that included Cushman and Wakefield and members of the congregation. Um, I think the landmark status raised a concern about uh, the cost of repairs, not just the report repairs needed to be made, but the manner in which they would have to be made, which would exacerbate the financial stress on, on, on a viable solution for the structure. Okay, but, but you were not part of those discussions. Okay. I was not. Um, okay. Um, those are the questions I have uh, now um, based on what we heard today. But um, like I said, we will be giving you some other questions, including these that you can just respond in writing. That would be great. Okay. Again, commissioners, any final questions for today? Again, we will have another opportunity for uh, questions um, and we will have presentations by our uh, experts at our next public meeting um, and uh, set, that will set forth some guidelines for us to do the financial analysis as well. Um, but so there will be opportunities for more questions on any aspect of the application in the future. Uh, but if there are no other questions today, then I think we'll go ahead and um, close the proceedings, <laughs> which we've done, and um, which I, I think we don't need to vote on. We don't need to do. Right. Yeah. So we will um, thank everybody for participating. We thank the public who may be listening today. Again, if any members of the public wish to continue to send opinions, please do so through our testimony portal, which is 
testimony at lpc.nyc.gov so we can ensure that all opinions that submitted are reflected in our files and can be shared with the commissioners, all of the commissioners. Okay, so with that, we will um, thank everybody and see you in September. And we will now move to the next public meeting item. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. We will now move to public meeting item number two, LPC 22-02942, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1493, lot 107, 7 East 81st Street in the Metropolitan Museum Historic District. This is a row house designed by Griffith Thomas, uh, built in 1878 to 79, uh, and the application is to redesign and reclad the facade and replace ironwork. Uh, this was last read into the record on July 12th, 2022, uh, but was not presented due to lack of time. And then prior to that, it was presented at the public hearing of November 23rd, 2021, when no action was taken at that time. Uh, the applicants will begin the presentation after we open the proceedings. Okay, thank you. Sorry, commissioners, I'm gonna send you a request to unmute so we can do this. Commissioner Lutfi, would you make a motion to open the proceedings? So moved. And Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the applicants may speak after the staff, staff uh, introduces the project. Um, I think I am doing the- interview. Yeah, we're gonna go right to the okay. end. <laughs> All right, thank you, Corey. Uh, good morning, commissioners, or good afternoon, commissioners, um, Chair Carroll. Uh, I am Sarah Scher from Higgins Quays Barth and Partners, and I am joined today with my colleague, Cass Stackelberg, as well as Katerina Heil, uh, the architectural designer and principal of Studio Cas, who will be available to answer any questions after the presentation. The commissioners last reviewed this application at 7 East 81st Street to reclad a modified stuccoed brownstone row house with limestone in November of 2021. Overall, the majority of the commissioners present were supportive of the project and could accept the recladding of the building, though some commissioners had concerns with design hierarchy specifically commenting on window proportions and treatment of the base. Uh, there was also a question about how the existing cornice would relate to the new cladding. Uh, in an effort to respond to the commissioner's comments, we carefully studied other buildings in our row, as well as other buildings within the historic district. First, I will note that some of the dimensions and proportions of the neighbors in our building were originally misrepresented in the public hearing drawings, which may have contributed to um, some of the concerns about window proportions. Um, for example, as you'll see in these drawings, the building to the right's windows were shown more narrow than they actually are. Um, also, we were showing maintaining the existing window sizes, which was represented slightly differently than the actual existing conditions. The widths and lengths have been corrected and showing these conditions accurately helps resolve these proportion issues. So here is what was previously presented on the left with dimensions and uh, proportions corrected for this property and the neighboring properties. And here is the current proposal on the right. We have addressed the commissioner's comments on the window proportions by studying similar limestone buildings in the row and creating a hierarchy and window opening size from larger to smaller at the top. Uh, we have also addressed the commissioner's comments on the base by running in the balustrade across the Piano Nobile level and centering entrance. We feel this strengthens the design of the base and directly responds to commissioner's concerns about design hierarchy. Uh, because it's been a while since we last reviewed this proposal, I'm going to do a very quick refresher on the building. Um, our building is located right here uh, on the north side of East 81st Street between Madison and Fifth Avenues. It was once part of a row of 10 uh, brownstone houses that were developed in 1878. This is what that original 10 uh, building row looks like today. All of these buildings have either been reclad, demolished, or uh, rebuilt um, in either limestone or uh, brick. Um, there's also no longer any alignments across the row. 7 East 81st Street, our building here, has been stuccoed and painted a limestone color since prior to designation. Um, the building is within the Metropolitan Museum Historic District and is less than half a block away from the museum. As we stated in our original presentation, we feel a proper limestone redesign of this front facade will enhance the gateway to this very important landmark. Some historic photos of the building. Uh, as you can see in the 1911 photograph, our building he is here under the red arrow. Uh, the three photos show that the buildings um, from the row 
changed over time, um, either from, from a brownstone road to a diverse row of brick and limestone buildings. It also shows how um, all the historic, most of the historic fabric from the facade has been stripped other than the original sheet metal cornice, which we will be keeping as part of the project. As I mentioned earlier, the majority of commissioners were supportive of the recladding of the front facade based on the historic context and existing conditions. And some photos of the existing conditions showing all the details stripped off, the facade stuccoed and painted, and the through wall louvers. Um, we looked at two of the other limestone clad buildings in our row to help with window proportions and detailing. Here are some existing photos of 2123 East 81st Street, and here are the original drawings. Um, both of these buildings, because they were in the same row, are the same width as 78 East 81st Street. So uh, we felt that using these window sizes would be helpful for the technique of um, adjusting the proportions as well as simplifying the window surrounds as one goes up the facade, creating some more hierarchy. So we adjusted the window sizes of uh, 70 East 81st Street to reflect 2123 East 81st Street and have changed to six over six wood windows to help with the proportions as well. Here's a solid to void ratio of the proposed facade, which is uh, approximately the same solid to void ratio for 21 East 81st Street utilizing the original drawings. Uh, some commissioners felt that the base needed to have a stronger presence. So we also studied ways to center the base and bring the balustrade across uh, looking at examples in the historic district. Uh, these are four examples within that district and uh, the two buildings on the um, right, which have a uh, double uh, two window bay wide with three openings at the bottom were particularly helpful with our redesign. Uh, so here's the previously proposed base on the top and the new proposal on the bottom showing a centered entrance with a side door and a window and setting having balusters in front of each power level window, the balustrade now runs across the base. Uh, so adjusting the base requires a, a change to the previously proposed area way, including centering the stairs um, and having the fencing uh, and railing jog towards the facade. The area way is proposed to have a fixed limestone planters and limestone pavers. Here we see that in elevation, the railing design remains unchanged from previous proposal, but with the gap in the center and the planters behind. Here's a detail of the new uh, door design with solid wood doors and a limestone surround that has uh, supported brackets that help support the balustrade above. Uh, and at the previous hearing, there was a question about the relationship of the existing sheet metal cornice and the new limestone facade. So we have an existing and proposed section showing that the backup masonry will remain um, behind the cornice and the limestone below will have the same thickness as the existing stucco and brownstone, maintaining that existing relationship between cornice and facade. Uh, to reiterate a point from the last presentation, this is just a recladding project. The backup masonry will remain and the interior floor levels will remain the same. Here are materials, including uh, Indiana limestone cladding, painted wood windows, dark green doors at the base, and black iron fencing at the area way. And here is a rendering of the proposal showing the proposed facade uh, with the adjusted windows uh, and the base. We believe we have addressed all of the commissioner's comments to have more hierarchy on the facade with a stronger base and windows that become simpler and more compressed as one goes up the facade. Um, thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions, commissioners? I don't see any questions. Um, I do, we did get um, a letter on this, so. All right. Um, okay, so we did get a letter from uh, Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts, which uh, still has concerns about the Newell post uh, and fence design and thinks that the tripartite door should be restored. Okay. And that a letter as always with all letters that are submitted for uh, revised proposals was shared with the commissioners in advance of today's hearing, uh, today's meeting. Okay, any other questions commissioners? All right, I think we're ready to begin our discussion. So this, um, this is an application we saw a while ago, um, and it's back today with some revision and revisions in response to the comments that we made at the public hearing. 
Um, this is a building in the Metropolitan Museum Historic District where we, uh, this district predates the Upper East Side Historic District and does not have the no style termination. Um, so this is a building that began life as a brownstone and has um, all had uh, its stoop and ornament removed and its facade stuccoed and the proposal is to do a recladding and uh, in limestone and uh, the applicant has changed proportions and details particularly at the base in response to our comments. Okay, Commissioner Bland, would you like to start? I can, yes. Um, I don't recall if I saw this before, but um, we see we see projects like this fairly often, so maybe that's that's why I don't recall it. Uh, in any event, um, it seems as if now that uh, they've corrected the uh, proportions on the drawings, I don't know how they got it so far off, but nonetheless, they've corrected it. I think it seems quite reasonable to me. Um, I'm not seeing anything that catches my, my eye as inappropriate. So I, I think I'm okay with it. Moving along. I wonder, I wonder what, what that noise was. Yeah, what was that ringing? Something at Saracen maybe. Maybe. Let's see, Sarah. Sarah's off. Um, maybe, maybe you can um, take over, um, Vice Chair Bland, while sure. Sarah's why getting back just, on. Why don't we just go around our old table? I think Jean Lucky was would be next. Yeah, um, I, uh, you know, I agree with your assessment, Fred. That thankfully the uh, uh, the contextual proportions have been fixed, which have uh, you know change the uh, the designer's perspective on this. And I think as a result, uh, the new uh, configuration of the windows, the so, you know, the tweaking of the sizes and the six over sixes uh, at, at the top work well. I, I think moving the, the door to the middle uh, works and changing uh, uh, the balconies is also a good idea. I, I actually, the only thing I would tweak, I, I like the fence, but the only thing I would tweak would be the color of the door at the base. Like to me, it seems like it maybe should be a black or just a, a dark wood. Okay, good. Um, let's see, who, who is next around our table? Um, Commissioner Jefferson. Yeah, there we go. Okay, you're back, Sarah. Thank you very much, My Vice Chair Bland. I, okay. Seems to be yeah. a fire nearby, so. Oh, is that what? <laughs> and to check it. Thank you for taking over. It is safe anyway. <laughs> yes. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Hi, it's a well-developed facade, and the symmetry works very well. I, I, I think the balcony is a wonderful touch. This is appropriate. Commissioner Gustafson. Yep. Agreed, appropriate as is. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Yes, I think it's appropriate as it's presented. Commissioner Holford Smith. I agree, appropriate. Commissioner Goldblum. Okay, I think he's uh, had to drop off for a bit. Okay, Commissioner Devonshire. Appropriate as presented. Okay, and Commissioner Chen. Likewise, yeah. Great. So I think there's a consensus to approve. Um, I'll go ahead and read this motion. Okay. In the matter of docket number 22-029427 7 East 81st Street in the Metropolitan Museum Historic District, a row house designed by Griffith Thomas and built in 1878 to 79. This is an application to redesign and reclad the facade and replace ironwork. I note that the building's stoop, window, and door surrounds were removed sometime between 1940 and designation. 
Um, and I recommend approval, finding that except for the cornice, the character defining features of the facade's original Italianate style were lost prior to the designation of the historic district. Therefore, the proposed facade will not eliminate an intact original facade design or diminish the unity of the road, that the 20th century facade alterations and the areaway ironwork are not unique or representative of exceptional details or craftsmanship. Therefore, the work will not eliminate a significant later alteration, that without the context of the former row, the existing window alignment is an awkward and atypical presence within the streetscape, that the proposed work is in keeping with the early 20th century development of the historic district, which included the redesign of existing buildings and construction of new buildings in classically inspired styles, that the proposed limestone cladding will be in keeping with cladding at an, at an immediate neighboring house, as well as other buildings within the streetscape in terms of material, material texture and finish, that the rusticated base, bracketed balustrade, profiled window surrounds, and symmetrical pattern of the punched openings will be consistent with aspects of historically classically inspired facades and typical of alterations which occurred over time in the Metropolitan Museum Historic District. That the prominence of the features of the ground and second floors of the and the incremental decrease in window opening heights and ornamentation at the upper floors will be consistent with a hierarchical order, which is characteristic of classically inspired facades, that the windows and doors will be compatible with the facade design and surrounding streetscape in terms of proportions, placement, materials, configuration, operations, and finish, and that the replacement of the areaway paving steps and ironwork, as well as installation of planters will be in keeping with Areaway components and configurations found at other townhouses without stoops within this historic district. All right, and Vice Chair Plan, would you second that motion? Second. Okay. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? All right, I'm mute. Uh, Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Devonshire. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. It's not here. Commissioner Gustafson. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Commissioner Lutfi. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion passes. Right. That's approved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. All right, so that concludes our public meeting agenda. We'll now move to our public hearing agenda. Okay, and we'll start with public hearing item number one, LPC 22-08557, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of the Bronx, block 5818, lot 2072, 4617 Waldo Avenue in the Fieldston Historic District. It's a late 20th century modern style house designed by David Paul Helpern Associates and built in 1879 to 80. The application is to remove a retaining wall and paint the house. Hey, commissioners, the applicants have entered the hearing and the staff will walk you through the presentation. Uh, Lisa, you now have control so you can advance the slides using your arrow keys or your mouse. Good afternoon, commissioners. Lisa Schaefer, preservation staff. Uh, the application for 4617 Waldo Avenue has two components to it. Uh, the first is for the removal of an existing masonry wall at the front property line, and the second is to paint the house. Oops, go back. Okay, so this is uh, the current condition of the wall. It is a uh, stucco clad wall that is very deteriorated. Uh, as you can see, a large tree has grown into it, pushing it out towards the street, as well as damaging the sidewalk. Okay. So just some additional photos showing the condition of the wall. And there's from the back, the tree growing into it. So this wall, it was actually built as part of a wall that runs across this and the adjacent property. So this is the subject property and the wall goes all the way 
across the other one. And it was actually built in conjunction with the neighboring house, uh, this Mediterranean revival style house that was built in 1928. And when the lot was subdivided in the 70s, uh, that's when the house that is currently on the lot was built, but the wall has remained there. Uh, the um, wall at the adjacent property uh, has been well maintained and that will remain. And the owner proposes to replace the wall where it's being removed uh, with bushes. And the second part of the proposal is to paint the house. And this is the color that they, the owners are proposing. And this is a, it's a late 20th century modern house. And it was built with vertical wood siding with a stained finish allowing the wood grain to read through. And this is a photo of the actual wood siding as it looks now. And this is just to show you that there are a few examples of some mid 20th century modern style houses in the district that do have painted finishes. They're wood sided and they're painted. And uh, the owners are here and they would like to say a few words. Okay, so the owners may speak, please go ahead. Just state your name for the record before you begin. I'll kick it off. My name is Etana Smith. Thank you so much for the time today. Thanks to Lisa and her team, the commissioners, all the chair people for this opportunity. Mike, I hope he's on, my husband, I hope Mike Smith is on. Uh, we have purchased the home and we moved in in March of this year. This retaining wall um, has caused some issues financially as well, especially yesterday after the, um, the raid, that flood that we had, my whole front yard was flooded um, because this water, real, this, this retaining wall does cause a drainage issue. I've had, even including today now, five different contractors to come in and look at the drainage problem. And a lot of it is because of the retaining wall where it just keeps the water where it is. I'm really not sure why the previous homeowners did not remove this, I guess, because they had to go through this process. Um, I also am not sure yet. I'm trying to look into the plans of what the piping situation is under the house. I'm obviously no expert, but I, I had um, somebody come in and um, enough, uh, who gave me the opinion that it's possible that the pipes are basically ending underground underneath the, the retaining wall, which could also the new pipes of this new house, which could also lead to some of this deterioration. The last thing that wasn't mentioned on here, um, um, I will say I have two young children and although this wall, we don't let them near this wall, I did do a lead test and it, did, now this is a store-bought instant lead test, but did come up positive. So just something to really reiterate that I would very much appreciate um, the consideration as well, that this is not just a hazard to the property, but a hazard to my family. Okay, all right, commissioners, do we have any questions about either the wall or the uh, painting of the wood siding? Oh, the painting. Uh, yeah. The painting of the house, the painting um, has a house hasn't been painted in um, 40 years, about 60% of all this, the, the cedar planks have to be replaced. That's a must. I just got my new garage door and that was approved by Lisa. So a, um, either way, the house has to be painted. I know in the photos, it shows that the colors are very different, the three options, but it's actually only a drop lighter. And I think it would fit really nicely with the block with, with the houses that are sur surround um, this property. Okay, thank you. All right, I don't think we have any questions. Um, let's see if we have any public testimony. If you're in the meeting and would like to testify on this item, please raise your virtual hand so we can identify you. And I will turn it over to Sonia Gior to take us through the testimony. Thank you. So we do not have any previous signups for this item and I'm not seeing any hands raised. Um, and so I will uh, note a uh, request from the community board that I'll note for the record that Community Board 8 has requested an adjournment and is unable to comment on or approve this application because of a lack of safety and other pertinent information pertaining to the retaining wall, its proposed removal and the replacements. 
if any proposed to be provided therefore, which information was not provided to or offered by the applicant or staff of LPC. And I'll turn it back to you, Chair Carroll. Okay, thank you. And I think this is uh, due to a schedule. I really understand um, what Sonia is saying about what wasn't provided. Um, okay. Keith, Keith, sir, if you don't mind just explaining. I think this is related to a scheduling issue. Okay. Right. Sonia, this, so the... Yes, and so um, that was just a statement that the community board had provided asking for us to read. Um, and so, sure. yes, I know there was some trouble with scheduling between. I don't, I, yeah, I don't know why. I, I did. I did submit this deck twice to them, and I received confirmation two times. Um, and I followed up. I was. This is probably one of the most important things right now, pressing for me, my family. So uh, this is a priority, and I really did try to get a date with them. Okay. So, and I think that there, you know, that sometimes community boards adjust their schedule in the season and our um, long practice has been that we do require applicants to present to the community board, except that when the community board has changed their regularly scheduled meeting times that an application would uh, be appear before them before our public hearing. And if that application is uh, a more routine application, we will move ahead anyway and not uh, penalize applicants for the community boards changing their schedule. And we also have to be mindful of our own schedule backing up. And so um, unless it's a, a highly controversial or item of significant interest in a neighborhood, we will proceed. So that's what we're doing now. But should we take an action today, I would encourage you to continue to work with the community board to address whatever their safety issues are. Understood. Thank you. Great, thank you. All right, um, commissioners, do we have any questions, final questions before we begin our discussion? Okay, I'm starting to request uh, to unmute. Let's look at that. All right, and Commissioner Holford Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you. And Commissioner Chapin, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and, and we'll now begin our discussion. Um, and this is, there's two parts. One is there's a, fra a fragment or a remnant of a wall or part of a wall that uh, it belongs to the adjacent property and a portion of it remains on this lot since this lot was once historically subdivided from that property. So the uh, proposal is to remove that portion of the wall that's on this property. And we've heard testimony about the condition of it. And then the second part of the application is to paint the house. The applicant has said that they have to replace much of the siding. And so they want to have a uniform appearance. Commissioner Devonshire, would you like to start this one? Sure. Um, I'm okay with the, the wall removal. Um, I'm hoping the applicant will, will undergo appropriate remediation of the lead. Um, otherwise, the ground will get contaminated. I am not in favor of the change in color of the facades. I think the, the part of the original design is that darker color, and I think it should probably remain as such. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Chen? Yeah, I'm sort of in, uh, in the agreement of uh, Commissioner Devonshire. Commissioner Bland? I'm in the same camp. And, and let, me, let me say one yes, thing. Yes, please do. Wall. If I could say one thing about the wall. Um, it is a historic, it's part of the historic um, um, community uh, because it was part of the uh, neighboring house. But I think when they subdivided and built this house, um, they've sort of lost the uh, reason for that wall. And I think it can be eliminated and a, and a hedge put in. I think that's a reasonable thing to suggest. But I do like the co darker color. Okay. Commissioner Lutfi. I agree with my uh, fellow commissioners. I, I think actually the hedge might look better than the wall um, in terms of... Um, how it relates to uh, the house. And uh, thanks, uh, Michael, for talking about um, abatement, because that seems very important. And I I'm guessing that the color might have been a little lighter than what it is right now. So I, I definitely prefer 
where it is, but I wouldn't have a problem if um, the applicant worked with staff so that, you know, it's more natural wood color, um, but closer to where we are right now. Okay. Am I allowed to interject? No, you can't at this point. Okay. We'll uh, we'll continue our discussion. The hearing is closed, so we're going to continue our discussion, and then the staff can talk to you afterwards. And if you, if I, I believe, if you want to, if you have something that you think is really pertinent right now, you may email Lisa, and Lisa can add any information if we deem that it's uh, important for our conversation. Commissioner Jefferson. I, I agree with my fellow commissioners. I think the gray color is probably more appropriate. Commissioner Gustafson? Yep, I, I agree as well. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Yes, um, I'm in agreement about the removal of the wall. I think that's fine uh, with making sure that it's um, protected and abated properly. Um, I do think that, uh, and would like to understand if in fact the original wall is stained or oil bleached cedar, um, that's, that, that would make a difference, I think, and they can oil bleach, I believe, maybe Michael can tell us if not, if you can, if you can oil bleach light on an already oil bleached dark, I, I don't know. But I, I think it can absolutely be lighter, much lighter gray, but it needs to be in the gray family rather than in the kind of the cream world. Okay. <laughs> All right, great. And I don't know if Lisa or Corey, if you can talk about the existing stain. I think Lisa may have lost her connection. Uh, I, my understanding is that it is not a paint film. It is some sort of stain. Uh, that is the existing condition. Okay. Sarah? Yes, please, Michael. Yeah. It's like, it's like I, I, in the close up photograph, I saw that there was some incipient rust around nail heads, which suggests to me that it wasn't a paint film, but a, but a stain. And that, that ends up being part of the problem. If stains aren't renewed every five years minimum, um, they, they become ineffective. They, they wear away. So it, that's kind of a problem with, with stains. Okay. So, but, oh, sorry, um, Chair Carroll, um, Michael, can you, once this, there is some vestige of stain that's a darker stain, can right. you lighten the stain? In other words, can you add a lighter stain or do you have to keep going in the dark directions? You, no, you, you can add a lighter stain. It'll, it'll, you, if, if this was my house, I would do, I would do some tests first. Um, you don't wanna go about a process of actually bleaching the stain. Um, but you could add another stain on top of it and incrementally get get lighter. I mean, perhaps they could work with staff and and do some new staining tests. Okay, that sounds good. Commissioner uh, Holford Smith. Um, I agree with my uh, fellow commissioners. I and I think that the whether it's a <clears throat> a true stain or a, some kind of a transparent paint, it should allow the grain to read through and not be opaque. But I think they can work with staff on that. And I agree with Michael that it would be advisable to do tests. Okay, great, thanks. And Commissioner Chapin. Uh, yeah, uh, I agree also. I think that uh, it needs to be a naturalistic color given both the setting and uh, Filson and also the particular uh, the material that was originally used. But it doesn't necessarily have to be that original dark gray, but this, is inappropriate. I think uh, I think a stain and uh, working with the staff for a stain to move toward the uh, color palette that the applicant would like would be uh, the way to go, as long as it looks naturalistic in the environment. Right, right. And, and I agree. I think that having something that is uh, naturalistic and, and relates to the environment here is important as this is part of the character of the Fieldston Historic District. All right, so I think we're in agreement to recommend approval of removing the wall and approval of re, uh, refinishing the uh, wood siding, uh, but to work with staff to uh, do some a little bit of testing on the stain and to pick a more naturalistic 
slightly darker color that would be uh, more uh, evocative of the original and relate to the surrounding landscape. Commissioner Devonshire, would you make a motion? Well, you did it already. <laughs> <laughs> This is this is where I get to screw it up. Okay. <laughs> In the matter of LPC 22085574617 17 Waldo Avenue in the Field City Historic District, an application to remove a retaining wall and paint the house. I recommend approval with some modifications of the application, finding that the portion of the masonry wall on this lot is very deteriorated and damaged by a tree, that the wall will remain on the adjacent property, thus maintaining the historic relationship between the masonry wall and the Mediterranean revival house it was built with, that the removal of the masonry wall will not cause the elimination of a site feature that contributes to the special architectural character of the late 20th century modern style house, that a slightly lighter finish of the wood siding of the house will not detract from its special architectural character or call attention upon itself in the streetscape, that the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural and historic character of the building or the Fieldstone Historic District. However, the uh, wood siding should be treated with a tenant stain in cooperation with the Landmarks uh, Preservation Commission staff to preserve the natural wood appearance of the siding and um, a slightly lighter color than the original may be acceptable, but that will be determined between the applicant and the staff. Perfect. Commissioner Chen, would you second that motion? Second. All right, Mark, will you call the vote? Yeah, um, Chair Carroll? Aye. Commissioner Bland? Aye. Commissioner Shamir Barron? Aye. Commissioner Chapin? Aye. Commissioner Chen? Aye. Commissioner Devonshire? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Commissioner Gustafson? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Commissioner Lutfi? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. With 10 in favor and none opposed, the motion passed. So that's approved with that modification. So please continue to work with the staff. So uh, we are a little more than an hour behind schedule. So we are going to break for lunch now and uh, we will resume at 1.05 and uh, we'll resume with public hearing item number two. So I'll ask everybody to try to uh, return promptly at 105 so that we can um, keep a reasonable schedule as we move forward with the rest of the public hearing agenda. And we'll ask all members of the public to voluntarily exit the meeting so that you can easily reach